It's Saturday night, and a teenaged boy and girl are out on a date. They are strolling through a shopping mall, with plans to see a movie later at the theater attached to the mall. As they walk through the mall waiting for their show to start, the girl spots something. It's a photo booth. She excitedly grabs the boy's hand and pulls him inside. They close the curtain, insert a coin, and the machine comes to life, snapping a series of photos. The two exit the booth, but both seem to be a little… off. It's getting close to showtime, though, so they start making their way to the movie theater. Meanwhile, unbeknownst to the mall patrons, something is happening deep below the ground. The boy and girl exit the theater and walk arm in arm through the alley back toward the parking lot where the boy left his car. It's late now, the sun has long since set, and they're all alone. But they don't hear the footsteps behind them, or sense the pair of bodies that are following them, getting closer and closer. They get to the car, it's the only one left in the parking lot, and the boy takes out his keys to unlock the car when he fumbles and drops them to the ground. As he bends over to pick them up, he finally sees who has been following them. It's them, a pair of doppelgangers coming straight towards them. They look exactly like the boy and girl, except for their faces, which are horribly distorted, with strange lumps and no eyes or mouths. They look as though they were a drawing of a face that was somehow smudged out. The boy quickly gets the keys and grabs the girl, dragging her away from the creatures, who are now reaching for the boy and girl, grasping and clawing at their faces as they try to moan through their skin-covered mouths. He gets the car unlocked, and both manage to get inside. As the creatures bang on the windows, the boy starts the engine and drives away, leaving the abominations behind. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-715, also known as my face that I may be. SCP-715 is a take-your-own-photo brand photo booth, a product of the Sony Corporation made in the 1970s. This is a standard-looking photo booth, bearing a close resemblance to the many thousands of others that were in operation around the world at the time, with no anomalous visual characteristics at all. The only detail setting this machine apart from its countless brethren is a small metal tag which has been added to the back of the machine at some point but a significant amount of wear has made it impossible to read what, if anything, was ever stamped on the tag. SCP-715's basic operation is also not anomalous in appearance. It will only activate if an individual sits inside and inserts the required coinage, at which point it will take a series of photos, just like a normal photo booth. The photos will also appear normal, though often some will be heavily distorted and obscure the subject's face in various ways. What truly sets this photo booth apart, however, is what happens outside of the booth when the pictures are taken. While the individuals who had their photos taken, classified as SCP-715-B instances, are able to exit the booth with no obvious effects, below them all, deep underground, something truly terrifying takes place. Underneath the mall is Site-81715 an extra-dimensional space which is accessible through a mall maintenance service door located in sub-basement 3, a door that does not appear on any of the mall's structural blueprints or in other records. The site consists of a giant cavernous room, which appears to have been hewn right out of the surrounding limestone. In the middle of the room is its most distinguishing feature, a large, deep pit. The walls of the pit are made of an unidentified substance, though it appears similar in both appearance and composition to human fat tissue. These fleshy walls secrete a powerful, corrosive substance, which makes examination and exploration of the pit particularly dangerous. When SCP-715 is activated in the mall above, a humanoid creature, classified as SCP-715-A, will appear in this pit. The bodies of these creatures are similar in appearance to the individuals who had their picture taken inside of 715, but their faces are radically different. Each has severe facial disfigurements and abnormalities, such as large growths, deep lacerations, and the absence of facial features. After appearing in the pit, these SCP-715-A instances will attempt to scale the fleshy walls of the pit and leave Site-81-715. These instances are considered hostile, 
and Foundation security personnel are authorized to neutralize the creatures by any means necessary. Further research into how the SCP-715-A entities are formed and what exactly the pit is are ongoing, and it's not currently known how many 715-A instances exist down in the pit. With the entities who were able to climb out of the pit able to be relatively easily neutralized by security forces, SCP-715 was originally classified as safe. It was contained at its point of origin within the mall in Ohio, and Foundation personnel posing as mall employees would collect the photos printed by the machine. However, following additional discoveries, this classification necessitated changing. The Foundation began noticing inconsistencies with SCP-715-B entities after a researcher tested SCP-715 himself by sitting inside and having his photo taken. Soon after, he began acting in ways that were considered strange, such as when he turned down a promotion to a prominent position with better pay and perks for seemingly no reason, and when he skipped a mandatory site inspection for reality-bending anomalies. After noticing these strange behaviors, a Foundation research head had an anomalous optical enhancement device placed in the oddly acting researcher's bedroom and learned a surprising truth about the SCP-715-A and B entities. The Foundation had been killing the wrong ones. The device, which could remove anomalous reality-distorting effects from images, showed that the researcher was actually one of the creatures from the pit with the telltale facial distortions. Following this shocking revelation, the research head used the same device on the creatures still inside the pit underneath the mall. They found that when the anomalous visual effects were removed from the distorted creatures who were trying to get out of the fleshy pit, that they were actually normal-looking humans. These SCP-715-A entities were the human beings who had entered the photo booth, had their pictures taken, and were somehow transported to the pit. They had been trying to escape their prison and tell the Foundation who they really were, but this only resulted in them being terminated by the on-site security forces. In order to fix this mistake, SCP-715 was hastily reclassified as Keter, and SCP-715 was removed from the mall in order to be stored in a secure locker at Site-19. Research personnel were no longer able to access SCP-715 without special authorization, and study of the interior was limited to what could be done via remote drone use only. The Foundation began rounding up all known instances of SCP-715-B, who were now the ones subjected to immediate termination. Foundation staff did manage to interview one 715-B instance, though, who had been previously believed to be a fellow Foundation researcher. It is unknown exactly what the researcher Doppelganger said in that interview, but it must have been extremely serious, as the end result was another complete change in protocol. All attempts to contain and neutralize instances of SCP-715-B would immediately cease, since if there were as many out in the world as the Doppelganger claimed, then ultimately, it would better maintain normalcy and ensure the secrecy of SCP-715 if they were allowed to go free. Sadly, the same was not the case for the SCP-715-A instances that still existed down in the pit. The researcher Doppelganger advised that it would be unwise to remove them from the pit, and the current Foundation policy is that down in the pit is where they will remain. Following this interview, SCP-715 was reclassified once again as safe. The photo booth was also moved again, this time to a maximum security storage locker at Site-81, and Foundation personnel have been prohibited from interacting with SCP-715-B instances at all. However, there is one more piece of information about SCP-715, and it is only accessible to those with proper security clearance. Another Foundation agent was found to actually be an instance of SCP-715-B and taken into custody for observation. While under surveillance, it was discovered that this instance, classified as SCP-715-B7, was emitting low-level radiation that was somehow directed at Site-81-715, the location of the pit. During an autopsy of the creature, it was found that the radioactive emissions were actually increasing in output and frequency, and soon after, a power outage and containment breach occurred at the site where the autopsy took place. Following these events, the body of SCP-715-B7 disappeared, and video surveillance confirmed that several members of Foundation staff were responsible, all of whom 
had been involved in SCP-715 research. The staff members escaped with the body and left no other evidence behind, save for a single photo with the ominous text, My ears that I may hear, my eyes that I may see, my mouth that I may speak. Do not touch my face. No other information regarding SCP-715 has been found, and many questions remain. Just what are instances of 715B, and what do they want? Are they some kind of hive mind colony that reproduces through the use of a mysterious photo booth? What happens to those left behind in the pit, and what will they do should they ever get out? Investigations are ongoing. A kindly looking old woman is carrying groceries into her home. When she closes the door, a crack forms in the wall, and a tile slides down off her roof, crashing to the ground and shattering. The next day, the local builder seems confused. He just fixed a similar problem a week ago at another house, and another the week before that. He'll patch this crack just like he did before and repair the roof, but as he does so, he can't help but think he'll be at another house with the same problem soon. Old people are like this sometimes, though, breaking things on purpose to get someone to come visit them. Oh well, as long as the money is right, he'll keep doing the repairs. That evening, the old woman is in bed when she's woken up by something falling onto her face. A crack is opened in the ceiling right above her bed, and plaster is falling on her. What is happening to this house? She would have to call the builder again in the morning and let him know that it was getting worse. She gets up to clean the plaster dust off her face, but stops halfway to the door. Was that a noise she heard? It sounded like it was coming from downstairs. Another noise. She definitely heard something. Is someone in her home? Hello? She cries out. Whoever you are, you better go. My husband is going to be home any moment, and he won't be happy. The noises seemed to have stopped. Maybe she was imagining things. Who would rob a poor old woman, after all? She didn't have anything worth taking. She still needs to wash the plaster off her face, though. She listens for a moment, and when she doesn't hear anything else, she opens the bedroom door and screams. The next day, a child stands in front of the house with a look of shock. Was there an earthquake? How could a house end up like this? They ring the doorbell, but there's no answer. They knock on the door and are surprised to find that the door is open. Grandma? The child cries into the quiet house. No response. The child enters and looks around. The house is a mess. Chunks of plaster have fallen off the walls and ceiling. Shelves have fallen over, spilling their contents and there's broken glass from shattered light bulbs everywhere. The boy looks up the stairs and can see that his grandmother's bedroom door is open and the light is on. Grandma, are you up there? Still no response. The child nervously starts up the stairs, gripping the railing tight. They quietly make their way to the bedroom and step into the sliver of light coming from the cracked door. The child pushes the door open to find their grandmother on the floor, only it isn't their grandmother. Whatever this is looks like their grandmother, but like she has been stretched and twisted, her body bent at angles where no joints exist. The child is paralyzed with fear, unable to do anything but stare. But the nightmare isn't over yet, because their grandmother is still alive. Sadly, reports like these are all too common in this small town that is plagued by attacks from SCP-783, also known as the Crooked Man. SCP-783 is an extremely dangerous anomalous creature that is currently plaguing the population of Tembe, a small rural village in Oxfordshire, England. Every 12 years during the fall and winter months, SCP-783 will engage in a period of hostile behavior that lasts for roughly 70 days, during which time it will target and attack people who are indoors and alone after sunset. Those targeted by SCP-783 will find that the building they are in rapidly deteriorates, causing damage and creating structural integrity issues. These often appear as cracks on the outside of the building that lead to the buildings taking on a crooked appearance. Unfortunately, while the SCP Foundation is aware of both the location and the periods within which SCP-783 operates, it has so far been unable to prevent any attacks. Additionally, the Foundation has yet to be able to produce either an image or even a physical description of SCP-783 due to the effect it has on recording equipment. 
Cameras set up to capture the anomaly produce only distorted or corrupted footage, leaving its appearance a mystery. Victims targeted by SCP-783 meet a fate that is, in many ways, worse than death. Their bodies will experience extreme deformations, as their bones suffer dozens of fractures and are stretched and twisted in various unnatural directions. They are then healed by the rapid generation of cartilage and the growth of extra skin to cover the new elongated limbs, leaving the victims a malformed knot of gnarled extremities. Some of the cases are quite severe, with one victim having just their forearm extended to over 2.4 meters and another who was left stretched to 12.5 meters in height. Despite the gruesome injuries suffered, the majority of victims are still alive following the attacks, though they will more often than not be left completely paralyzed, in a persistent vegetative state, or both. 27 victims of SCP-783 are currently being held in a long-term care facility within a wing of a local hospital that was requisitioned by the Foundation specifically for the care and treatment of 783 victims. Like many of the anomalies that the SCP Foundation investigates and contains, many of the residents of Tembi appear to have some awareness of the Crooked Man, and the anomaly has become something of a local boogeyman. Researchers have even documented local school children singing a nursery rhyme that appears connected and may even explain the origins of the creature. It goes, There lived a crooked man who made a crooked deal. He kept a crooked cane and his catch in crooked creel. He stole a crooked child who cried a crooked squeal. And that crooked little man was broken on the wheel. A month before a recent SCP-783 period of activity was to begin, a Class D personnel, D-209, was sent to live in a Foundation-owned home in the village. Audio and video recording equipment was set up throughout the house in case the D-Class was targeted, in the hopes that some information could be gleaned should something take place. 43 days after he began living in the house, something finally did. One evening while in bed reading a book, D-209 heard noises on the ground floor of the home. Cameras on the first floor experienced corruption and showed only a distortion moving through the house. When D-209 attempted to leave the bedroom and escape the home, they immediately encountered SCP-783. During a period of time that lasted roughly five hours, their bones were broken numerous times and reset over and over, leaving D-209 a twisted mass of flesh and bone. Strangely, at the exact same time that D-209 was being attacked, all 27 of the living prior SCP-783 victims in the hospital experienced violent seizures, despite most of them having been declared functionally brain-dead and the rest being totally paralyzed. Also concurrent with the attack was a seismic event on the outskirts of town, and the details revealed by this event were both illuminating and extremely disturbing. Foundation personnel were dispatched to the site of the seismic activity to investigate and determine if it was connected to SCP-783 in any way. There, they found a small group of angry townspeople, perhaps frustrated by seemingly unending paranormal events in their town and the lack of progress that had been made to stop them. After a tense standoff, SCP Agent Collins fired her service weapon into the air, and the crowd quickly scattered. Now, free of distraction, the agents could begin their investigation in earnest. They immediately spotted several objects sticking out of the earth. Upon closer inspection, these were identified as elongated human toes. A dig team was sent to the site, and by the next day, a mass grave had been uncovered that was filled with the twisted mass of what appeared to be victims of SCP-783. Their mutated and drawn-out bodies were well-preserved despite being buried directly in the ground, and had all been buried head down, with their arms extending deeper into the burial pit. As one researcher was attempting to take a tissue sample from one of the bodies, the ground beneath him gave way and he fell into the pit. He landed on the tangled mass of limbs which shifted under his weight, and he disappeared into the pit beneath them. Agent Collins immediately found a length of rope, tied it to her waist, and climbed into the pit with instructions to the on-site team to pull her back up when she signaled. Agent Collins descended into the pit beneath the bodies, and after several minutes, she was extracted, though without the missing researcher. At debriefing, she described how she found an anomalous location under the ground beneath 783's victims' corpses, and she was so rattled by what she saw that she was granted a temporary leave of absence. The Foundation had to know more, and a D-Class personnel was quickly selected for exploration of the underground anomaly. 
D-2172 was equipped with audio and video recording equipment, along with several scientific measurement tools, as well as a firearm, and was lowered down into the pit via crane. Their wired tether to the surface would both send the information they collected back, as well as serve as their lifeline to the surface. As D-2172 was lowered past the mass of corpses into the darkness, they experienced a sense of vertigo before it was realized that the anomalous effects extended to gravity as well, which had become reversed, and that they would need to start climbing up in order to descend further into the pit. They soon climbed out of the hole surrounded by the reaching, extended arms of corpses, and emerged into an open world with an overcast sky. It looked exactly like the town of Tembi, with the same buildings present there as in our world. The world appeared to be uninhabited though, with no sign of the missing SCP Foundation researcher. D-2172 began investigating the buildings, and found them all to be empty as well, though they did unfortunately find signs of a struggle in one house, with what looked to be evidence of the missing researcher's demise. They continued exploring the area, and found that the anomalous properties of the location extended to its borders too. And as the D-Class walked north out of the town, after several kilometers, they found that they were now somehow back at the southern edge of the town. D-2172 was ordered to return to the entry point, but as they walked, they were suddenly impeded by the deformed body of an SCP-783 victim that stretched across the road in front of them. D-2172 drew and fired their weapon at the entity, but it didn't react, and they were forced to retreat into the nearby woods. After several minutes, they stopped to rest, when they spotted something else. In the distance, the D-Class saw what looked to be a giant, white birch tree, and it was coming towards them. As the living tree approached, it became clear that it wasn't a tree at all. What looked like branches were extended bony fingers that it was using to walk. The long, branch-like fingers were coming out of the top of the tree, where D-2172 could see their origin. These branches were the elongated fingers of the missing SCP Foundation researcher. D-2172 turned to run as the giant living tree chased them back into the town, firing their weapon at the creature whenever they had the chance, but was unable to stop it. The visual feed was soon lost as the audio continued to broadcast the screams of D-2172. But this wasn't the end of the expedition. The on-site team was surprised to witness after several hours that the tether was pulled on twice, the signal that it should be reeled in. A medical team was sent to the site, since it was assumed that D-2172 would need immediate care, and the team began reeling in the line. After several minutes, they spotted the harness that should have been strapped to D-2172, but with nothing in it. They continued to pull, but the harness became stuck on the mass of corpses in the pit. They then noticed that it wasn't actually stuck there was a hand holding onto the harness for dear life. It was D-2172's hand. The team kept pulling as D-2172's arm kept stretching out of the pit to a length of over three meters. But eventually, the resistance became too much, D-2172 lost its grip, and it was seen sinking back into the mass of corpses inside the pit. Following this expedition, it was determined that only special operations teams and mobile task forces would be used to explore the dangerous anomalous location in the future. At least three such expeditions have been undertaken, though the details remain classified for the time being, and perhaps it is for the best if they remain so. The SCP Foundation will continue to monitor the town of Tembi in an attempt to learn more about SCP-783 and hopefully discover a means to contain it and its related phenomena. Due to the difficulty in containing the anomaly, it has been classified as Keter, and a local building adjacent to the Tembi Hospital has been requisitioned and designated as Provisional Site 5 in order to accommodate the increased Foundation presence. As the SCP Foundation continues to research this mysterious and highly dangerous anomaly, any victims of SCP-783 are to be retrieved, their injuries catalogued, and then their bodies are to be incinerated. As you can clearly see, this completely throws our entire understanding of our place in the universe into complete disarray," says the astronomer, as he excitedly makes his case to a panel of aged, and supposedly learned advisors. My observations leave no doubt that everything we previously suspected to be the absolute truth is wrong. The panel of advisors murmur, and lean close together to whisper to each other. The astronomer can't hear what they are saying but the passion and joy that he felt as he explained his findings to the room is quickly draining from his face. 
He can see the men mouthing the words, no, and lies, as they make disapproving gestures. But how could this be? Had they not understood what he was showing them? Maybe he didn't explain things in a way that they could comprehend. Here he was, the greatest scientist of his day, presenting hard facts, backed up by rigorous observations, and this was their reaction. The group of advisors finish conferring and grow quiet. The chief advisor clears his throat, and everyone in the room waits for him to speak. Royal scientist, this panel has examined your findings and listened to your theories. The advisor can't help but sneer at the word, and has decided that the ideas you present are not only incorrect, but dangerous. The astronomer can't believe what he's hearing. This panel, acting under the authority of the king, has charged you with the crime of heresy. The astronomer is shocked. He steps towards the panel to plead with them, but he's stopped by a pair of guards who grab him by the arms. Stop! Stop! I'm a man of science! I only presented you with the truth! But no one seems moved by his appeals. The panel watches as the astronomer is dragged from the room, kicking and fighting, still insisting on his innocence. The screams echo through the dungeon as the torturer cranks another notch on the rack, stretching the astronomer's body just a little bit more. He has no idea how long this has been going on. Hours? Days? The pain has been excruciating and without end. He closes his eyes, trying to escape the torture by retreating into his mind, but he's slapped on the face and brought back to the reality of his situation. Standing in front of him is the chief advisor, the same one who sentenced him to this inhumane treatment. You can end this any time you like. Simply recant your statements and admit you were mistaken and all of this will be over. The astronomer is unsure if by over he means that they will release him or simply kill him to put him out of his misery. But it didn't matter which the right answer was, he couldn't lie. The astronomer knew the truth, and no amount of pain, no matter how intense or how long they submitted him to it, would change what he now knew. Disappointed with the astronomer's steadfastness, the advisor signals to the torturer, who cranks the rack again, stretching the astronomer's body to the point where he feels like his bones might pop out of their sockets. Recant, the advisor screams, repeating the word over and over, growing louder as the astronomer's own cries increase from the pain caused by the torturer cranking the rack more and more. The astronomer closes his eyes again. He's certain this will be the end of him soon and that he will die with the great secret he's learned without getting the chance to share it with the world. But suddenly, the astronomer notices that the room has gone quiet, the advisor is no longer yelling, and the torturer has stopped operating the machine. The astronomer opens his eyes to see the advisor and the torturer both in a deep bow. His gaze continues up and he sees the king himself standing in front of him. The king stares at the astronomer for what feels like an eternity before simply asking, is it true? The astronomer, limbs still stretched on the rack, manages a nod, and with his remaining strength whispers, it's true. The king motions with his hand to the torturer, who stands up and begins releasing the astronomer from his constraints. The advisor protests, but my lord, this man… But he's cut off by the king with a stern look, and retreats back into his deep bow. Show me, the king says, as the astronomer stands rubbing his sore shoulders where the tendons and muscles were stretched far beyond their natural limits. The astronomer opens the door to his laboratory and gestures for the king to enter. The room is a mess of papers and scientific equipment, a reflection of the busy and scattered mind of the man who works here. The king is immediately drawn to a table with a large scroll. He spreads it across the table and examines it, but his face betrays no hint of what he is thinking. Is this what you showed my advisors? The astronomer nods yes. Would you like to see for yourself? The astronomer motions to the window, where a brass tube is attached to a tripod. The king approaches the device, but doesn't know how it works. The astronomer demonstrates by looking through the eyepiece. He moves it slightly, making small adjustments to make sure it is just right for the king. There, now look. The king bends over to peer through the telescope, and a look of shock comes over his face. What he sees is the most incredible thing he has ever witnessed. There, far above up in the sky, unable to be seen by the naked eye, is a man, and he is staring back at him. The planet that this played out on was not Earth, but a bizarre place that is one of the strangest anomalies in the entire SCP Foundation archive. This is SCP-007, 
also known as Abdominal Planet. SCP-007 is a spherical object located in the abdomen of a young man, or rather in the space where his abdomen should be, since most of the muscle, skin, and organs that should be present simply are not. The subject, a Caucasian male in his mid-twenties of average height and build, does not appear affected by the large missing portion of his body, and has not reported experiencing pain or discomfort of any kind. In the space where his abdominal muscles and organs should be is a small globe composed of soil and water. This sphere, which measures roughly 60 centimeters in diameter, resembles the planet Earth, though the arrangement of the continents does not match any known configuration from our own planet's history. The tiny planet has its own weather patterns, and even a small but still detectable gravitational pull. Perhaps the most fascinating aspect of SCP-007 is that it appears to be inhabited. Microscopic organisms that would correspond to roughly the scale of human beings on Earth have been observed on the surface of the planet. So far, two distinct intelligent species have been identified, both of whom seem to possess a technological level similar to the 15th century on Earth. It is unknown if the inhabitants of the abdominal planet are aware of the world outside of their planet, and communication attempts with the planet's occupants have been placed on hold by senior Foundation officials, pending further study into what effect an exchange may have on them or us. The human subject within which SCP-007 is located provided the Foundation with a name that he claims to be his, but no records of such a person existing have yet to be located. Upon being questioned about the lack of records, he willfully offered both a social security and driver's license number, but when they were checked against current records, neither had yet to be assigned by the US government. And the mysteries surrounding this man don't stop there. The subject has not shown the need for either food or water, and it is unknown what energy source his body continues to operate on without nutrition. He is capable of both eating and drinking though, despite the large missing section of his stomach, but it is still not known what happens to the substances after he swallows them. The man has above average intelligence and scored a 128 on an administered IQ test. He also generally appears friendly and amiable, and expresses only a passing curiosity about the planet located within his abdomen and how it came to be there. When asked about the origins of the planet, he replied very matter-of-factly that, I just woke up one day and there it was. I don't have any idea how it got there. Due to the poorly understood nature of SCP-007, it has been classified as Euclid and the small planet and the man it resides in are contained in a sealed, comfortably furnished 10 by 10 meter room that the subject is not allowed to leave. The subject is to be monitored closely by Foundation staff and has a weekly chess game with one of the attending doctors, which also serves as an opportunity to evaluate his mental health. So far, he has not shown any signs of mental illness or violent tendencies and seems to be quite content. In general, he appears happy with his restricted living situation inside the Foundation facility and has made no attempts to escape. The subject has made multiple requests for access to a computer with an internet connection, but due to potential security risks, this request has thus far been denied. A group of three Class D personnel approach the locked containment chamber. One of them is carrying a bucket and mop, but all three of them look jumpy and hesitant to move forward. An SCP Foundation guard walking behind them gives one of them a push forward with the barrel of his gun, and they continue stepping towards the cell door. All three of them nervously stare at the heavy locked metal door. Behind it, the sound of stone scraping against metal can be heard coming from inside. A second guard standing next to the door asks the three if they are ready. They don't answer, and the guard <laughs> starts to laugh. They never are. The guard loudly announces that Special containment procedures are beginning now. You know the rules. To maintain eye contact at all times while the other cleans. If you have to blink, do it one eye at a time, and announce before you close even one eye so everyone knows. The guard turns and starts to enter a code into the keypad next to the door. Each of the D-classes take a couple hard, last blinks, taking the last opportunity they have to shut both of their eyes at the same time before they begin. With a loud hiss, the sealed chamber door unseals. All right, eyes up, the guard commands. The door opens to reveal a small, dimly lit chamber. There are no furnishings, and much of the metal floor and walls are covered in a reddish-brown substance. And there in the corner is what they've heard stories and rumors about. The thing that has given them nightmares ever since they learned that they would have to enter its containment chamber, SCP-173. Or as most of the staff in the SCP Foundation call it, 
the sculpture. It looks so unassuming in person. Just a crude, concrete figure with a stupid-looking spray-painted face, standing motionless in the corner. The three D-classes get another push from the guard behind them, and they enter the chamber. The two assigned to watch SCP-173 assume their position in the middle of the room, their eyes locked on the sculpture as the other starts cleaning the foul substance off the floor and walls. It smells terrible, like a mix of old blood and human waste. The two assigned to watch 173 pay no attention to the one cleaning, though. They follow protocol to a T, maintaining their vigil and announcing each time they are going to blink, even if it is only one eye. The third one continues cleaning, trying his best to keep his own eyes locked on the sculpture as he attempts to mop around it without getting too close. D5933 does his job and doesn't break eye contact with SCP-173. Even though it hasn't moved, he can feel the presence of the sculpture, something within it, just waiting for him to slip up, to let his eyes avert for just one split second. They say that's all it takes. You stop looking for even an instant, and it's all over. With all of the fear coursing through his veins, it is hard to maintain focus. All he can think about is how dry his eyes feel, and blinking them one at a time never seems to be enough. He wants so badly to shut his eyes, to end their itchy, dry feeling. But he can't. Even with another watcher, it's too risky. There's suddenly a loud crack, but D5933 doesn't move his eyes away from 173. He can see in his periphery that the other D-Class dropped his broom and instinctively looked down at it. Luckily for him, there were others watching. D5933 shifts in place, taking a step back and bumps into something. He can't look at what it is, but he reaches behind him and feels that it's the other D-Class watcher. But wait a minute, why is he facing the other way? What are you doing? What's going on? He asks, his eyes never leaving SCP-173. What are you talking about? The other D-Class asks back. You're facing the wrong way. I'm facing the wrong way, you're facing the wrong way. We're supposed to be watching 173, what are you looking at? I am looking at 173, what are you looking at? D5933 doesn't know what's going on and starts to panic. The one cleaning is focused on his task, trying as hard as he can to quickly mop up an especially dirty corner of the cell. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. It's the worst sound D5933 could have heard. Achoo! <gasps> a sneeze just inches behind his head, followed by the sound of bones being cracked, a scream that was cut off too short, and then a sick thud as a body dropped to the floor. D5933 doesn't even have a chance to scream before a pair of concrete hands grab his neck and his own head is twisted around to see another identical-looking sculpture staring back at him. Ladies and gentlemen of the O5 Council, we have a problem. A senior researcher is giving a presentation to a group who remain largely in the shadows, obscuring both their identities as well as their reactions to his horrendous news. SCP-173, through means which we have not yet been able to determine, has multiplied. There's no reaction from any of the 13 figures seated around the large, curved table. The researcher in charge of SCP-173 waits for a response, anything at all. But after receiving none, he clears his throat and continues. We gave each of the new instances their own designation, SCP-173-1 and SCP-173-2. Two of the D-Class on observation duty during their regular cleaning of 173's cell were killed. The third was able to keep them both in his line of sight until they could be recontained and moved into separate cells. Again, no reaction from the shadows. But as you know, this wasn't the end of it. At some point, the instances of SCP-173 multiplied again, each splitting to form yet another instance. SCP-173-1 through 4 are all contained separately, but we don't know if or when another split will occur. The senior researcher waits, but no one on the O5 Council speaks or moves until the one seated in the very middle slides a piece of paper across the table in front of him. The senior researcher looks confused. He looks to the mobile task force guard stationed near the door but he too remains expressionless, eyes locked straight ahead. The researcher, unsure of what else to do, steps away from the lectern and walks towards the table. He picks up the piece of paper and reads it. Object class, upgrade from Euclid to Keter. Orders, continue observation. The senior researcher nods in agreement, thanks the O5 Council for their time, and leaves the room. Lights flash and siren blare in the halls of Site-19. It's a containment breach. Facility staff, researchers, and site guards all run down the hall, screaming, trying desperately to get away. There's no hope for any of them, though. In a flash, 
SCP-173 instances appear behind them, snapping their necks and dropping them to the floor before moving on to their next victim. There must be dozens of them. Even as a guard tries to keep their eyes on one instance, preventing it from moving, another appears behind them. The staff of Site-19 flee for their lives, screaming for someone, anyone, to help them. The senior researcher presses pause on the video. The terrified face of the senior researcher who gave the last presentation is frozen on the screen. An instance of SCP-173 is directly behind them, its hands wrapped around his neck in a split second before his life was snuffed out. The new researcher giving the presentation looks considerably more frazzled than his predecessor. He explains to the O5 Council that following this horrific containment breach at Site-19, at least 61 instances of SCP-173 are now unaccounted for. It is still unknown how they are replicating, but worryingly, there is evidence that the process may be speeding up. He presses play on a new clip from the security footage, which shows what appears to be multiple instances of 173 working in tandem, some using their bodies to block exits, others creating choke points in the facility corridors. We have theorized that SCP-173, as we are now referring to the collective instances, may possess a form of hive intelligence. It also appears that this intelligence scales with the number of instances that are nearby. This allowed them to implement tactics that thwarted our containment efforts, as they used instances to block our containment teams from being able to pursue others. What you have in front of you is a proposal for revised special containment procedures. What I recommend may sound drastic, but it's what I truly believe is the only way to contain this threat. Each of the O5 Council members picks up the folder in front of them, bringing it into the shadows that obscure them. What I propose is that SCP-173 instances no longer be kept in containment cells, but instead placed inside of form-fitting metal containers. We can then use SCP-120 to transport the instances to the Foundation site on the lunar surface. The facility will have to be abandoned, of course. It's too risky to maintain a presence there, but each of the instances will be fitted with a tracking collar to ensure that we will be able to detect if any of them are somehow able to escape. The senior researcher waits. After a time, a paper is once again slid across the table. He approaches and picks it up. He sees that it is the same folder containing the revised Special Containment Procedures proposal. He opens it to find that it has been stamped, approved. Breaking news flashes across the screen. A worried-looking reporter appears as though she didn't have time to do her hair or makeup before rushing on air to deliver this special report. She explains that civilian deaths across North America are now estimated to be more than 500,000 people in the last 48 hours as these still unidentified creatures continue their deadly rampage across the continents. It is unknown how many of them there may be, but the number of sightings has led some to estimate that there may be hundreds if not thousands or even tens of thousands of these living, neck-snapping sculptures. The reporter explains that rumors are circulating that the creature can be stopped by maintaining eye contact with it, but that this has yet to be confirmed. There is still no official word from the White House or from any members of Congress, and their current location and status are unknown, following reports that most of Washington, D.C. was overrun by the creatures earlier that day. The reporter suddenly stops speaking, and a terrified look comes over her face. Her eyes locked on something just off-screen. The camera pans over to show an instance of SCP-173 standing over a dead cameraman. There's a scream, and the camera goes back to the reporter, who now lies dead on her desk her head twisted 180 degrees, before there's another sound of bones breaking and the feed goes dead. A woman in an SCP researcher coat sits at a computer terminal in a secure bunker, a large, jeweled medallion around her neck. Personal log of Dr. Bright. From the little news I've been able to gather, it sounds like SCP-173 has besieged and destroyed four Foundation facilities pretty much simultaneously in the last 24 hours. Each instance shows the same strength as the original, and thousands of them working together are capable of ripping open concrete bunkers and compromising foot-thick steel doors. I alone have been killed 37 times in the last week. They can smell me, somehow, regardless of what body I'm in. The majority decision of the remaining O5s is that this is an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario unfolding, and they're gonna deal with the problem, or else the Russians are. They're evacuating this base, which means there won't be a single Foundation scientist anywhere in the New World. They say they're going to try to evacuate the surviving civilians, but I doubt it. There can't be more than a couple hundred people in all of North America anyway. I managed to make it down to a secure bunker, but who knows how long it will be until they're able to get in. I don't think there's any chance I can get out either. I'm running out of food, and I'm not sure which will get me first. Hunger, the sculptures, or what I know the O5s will inevitably do. Dr. Bright closes the computer terminal and sits back in her chair. 
She looks up at the ceiling of the bunker where the sound of concrete scratching against metal can be heard through the thick walls. A sullen and tired-looking researcher steps out of a room in the makeshift foundation site that has been established just outside of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. He's holding a piece of paper and closes the door behind him, which has had O5 Council authorized entry only hastily painted on the outside. A small group of foundation staff are waiting for him. They've gathered to hear what the overseers have decided to do in the face of this world-ending disaster. The researcher looks around at his colleagues' faces, and as they make eye contact, any hope they had is quickly replaced by the bad news they know is coming. He begins to read. Revised Special Containment Procedures Containment Zone X1, formerly North and South America, is to be denied access. Following saturation nuclear bombing, the number of SCP-173 instances has been reduced. All available Foundation resources are to be redirected to monitoring the ocean to ensure the integrity of Containment Zone X1. Foundation adjuncts from national navies are to perform around-the-clock patrols and sonar sweeps. Detected instances are to be contained and removed to SCP-120 for transport to the lunar containment site. That's it? One of the staff members asks. That's it, the researcher replies. Several of those present <laughs> begin to cry. There's nothing more they can do. Their homes, their friends, their families, all of them are gone. Killed either by the neck-wrenching sculptures or in the heat of a nuclear blast. Why? Why did they have to do it? One of the other staff who appears to be a former site guard asks. That's all we could do, another argues. There's much disagreement in the small crowd. No matter how they feel, though, this was the official order from the O5 Council. Their word is law, especially in a world where all law and order outside of the Foundation has broken down. There really was no other option. All they can do now is hope that the sacrifice of two whole continents was enough to keep it contained that SCP-173 is unable to cross the ocean to Europe, and that they remain safe on this side of the planet. The group grows quiet, mourning the loss of the world they once knew. When the silence is suddenly interrupted by someone running down the hall, it's another researcher carrying his own piece of paper. He tries to push past the group towards the O5 Council's door, insisting that they let him through, that he has important news that can't wait. What is it? demands the group. We deserve to know. The group wrestles the paper away from the junior researcher, and it is passed through the group to the same man who read the revised special containment procedures. He quickly reads the report. It's just a couple of lines, and his face goes white. What is it? What does it say? Comes a question from the crowd. A message from the North Atlantic Navy General Command. Verified sighting of SCP-173 in the United Kingdom. Nuclear bombardment authorized and executed. No survivors. SCP-173 has come for them. The sun rises over the battlefield. The American flag flaps gently in the wind. The world is silent. Bang! The door slams open, and the boy runs out of the house, making plane noises with his mouth. The toy bomber in his hand arcs and soars, dipping and diving, as it makes its imaginary bombing run around the backyard. Over the sandbox, swooping low through the thick grass, past the pond, under the swing set, and up, up, and away into the sky, climbing higher and higher in the direction of the treehouse with its American flag flapping in the morning breeze. What a perfect day. The boy breathes in the air deeply and looks around. His shoulders slump. He's bored already. Two seconds in the yard and he's already bored. What is there to do out here that he hasn't already done? He's played in the sand, he's swung on the swings, he's climbed up to the treehouse. He hears the car engine kicking into life somewhere out front. His dad's voice carries over to him on the breeze. I'm running late for work, I'll see you later. If you find my bag anywhere, don't go looking inside of it, just tell me where it is when I get home. Love you, bye. The wheels crunch through the gravel driveway, and the engine's sound slowly fades into the distance, leaving the boy alone in the backyard again, with nothing but the wind for company. Great, now he's got to find something to do for the whole day. He throws the toy bomber to the ground in frustration. A wing snaps off and bounces away into the flower bed. Uh-oh. He'll need to fix that before Dad gets home. Super glue, that'll do the trick. There must be some inside, his dad is always fixing things. But the boy's mission is almost immediately sidetracked. As soon as he steps into the house, he spots his dad's bag right by the back door, where he always forgets to look. The boy looks at it curiously for a moment. He wonders what's in there that his dad told him not to look at. He'll just have a little peek, not a proper look. He won't even open the bag all the way, just a little look inside. If anyone asks, he'll say he was looking for super glue. Wait, what's that? It can't be. A little pot with a red lid and big cartoonish letters on the side. Play-Doh? 
What's his dad doing with a pot of Play-Doh in his bag? He thought his dad had a really grown-up job. That's what his mom always says. His dad has a very secret grown-up job, very important, very secret. Is that really what he does at work all day, play with Play-Doh? The boy is far too grown up for Play-Doh. He hasn't played with it for years because it's for babies. No way is he going to play with it now. Nope, he's a big boy who plays with real toys. But still, a little look won't hurt. He'll take it out, squeeze it in his hands a bit, remember how babyish it is, and put it back. He definitely isn't going to play with it. The boy pops the red lid off and peers inside. Yep, just as he thought. Boring. Just a lump of red putty. Sitting there being all... all boring. But as the boy tips the pot out into his hand, it feels a bit weird. It moves a little in his palm. Is there an insect inside it or something? It feels like a pair of little legs. He rolls the lump over into his other hand and peers at it. Yes, a pair of legs sticking out from the red ball. Only, they're not insect legs at all. They're tiny, about the size of insect legs, but there are only two of them. They're totally red, matching the color of the Play-Doh, and seem to have a tiny pair of boots on the ends of them. The legs wiggle around helplessly, sticking up into the air, until all of a sudden, a hand appears sticking up out of the clay. It looks like a tiny person has somehow been buried in the Play-Doh upside down. The hand gets a good grip on the red ball and pushes and pulls at it, steadily freeing the rest of its body until suddenly a fully formed tiny man pops out of the surface. Roughly the size of the boy's fingernail, the little red man stands up straight and takes in his surroundings. Not only is the tiny person wearing boots, he's also got a backpack and a helmet on his miniature head, all made of Play-Doh. In fact, this tiny person looks just like one of those little green army man toys that his dad had when he was little. The little soldier looks up and sees the boy staring down at him, jumping back in fright. The boy laughs. He guesses he must look pretty scary to someone so small. He smiles at the little army man. The little army man very slowly lowers himself down to his knees, reaching down to the Play-Doh floor he's standing on. His little red hand seems to be feeling around for something in the putty. In fascination, the boy stares closely as the Play-Doh under the soldier's hand morphs into the shape of… what is that? A gun! The soldier lifts the tiny red rifle to his shoulder and points it straight at the boy's eye. He fires, and to the boy's surprise, something comes out. A stream of teeny tiny Play-Doh bullets pepper his eyeball. The boy throws the Play-Doh ball as hard as he can and blinks hard. A tiny scream goes with it. The bullets didn't really hurt that much, but his eye is a little watery now. The tiny soldier has a real working tiny assault rifle. He's starting to understand why his dad is still playing with Play-Doh. Where did that Play-Doh go? He must have thrown it into the backyard. The boy runs outside and looks around. There it is, just next to the sandbox. He creeps up to the ball cautiously, trying to see if the little soldier is still there. Wait, hang on. There he is. No, there he is. Is that another one? He kneels and peers at the small crowd gathering around the ball. He can't quite believe what he's seeing. Dozens of little men are milling around the red ball, with more marching out of it in formation every few seconds. Little red Play-Doh tents are being erected in a perimeter around the ball. A couple of tiny soldiers chop down a twig with tiny red axes and start a campfire. A mini red jeep weaves its way through the grass and a general hops out, with a cowering officer by his side. The tiny general barks tiny orders. It's difficult to hear what the man is saying, but it sounds like he's speaking English, only really high-pitched. He points to a group of soldiers who immediately rush over to the ball of Play-Doh and pull a ladder out of it. They rest the ladder against the edge of the sandbox, and a couple of them hurry their way to the top. Climbing up onto the wooden board, the pair of them split up, rifles in hand, checking the area is clear. The general is the next up the ladder. He surveys the yard with a battle-worn wariness, eyes coming to rest on the treehouse. He pulls out his binoculars and takes a good hard look at it, studying every inch of the tree before spotting the flagpole rising from the top. Lowering the binoculars with evident satisfaction, the general points a tiny hand at the enormous tree and cries out an order at the top of his little voice. A high pitch rises from the troops on the ground. They pump fists and slap backs. The army has grown already. As the boy looks back down at the platoon gathering in the grass, he sees a dozen more tents have sprung up. A group of soldiers stand in formation around the ball of Play-Doh, keeping watch in every direction. And there, a soldier sits on an acorn crying helmet in his hands, he weeps openly. There is a red cross on the tent next to him. That must be the medical tent. The boy crouches down on all fours and peers inside the tent. There, on the tiny red bed, surrounded by tiny red nurses, lies a soldier. His legs are bent out of shape, and he's crying out in pain. 
a doctor approaches and gives him the bad news before readying the saw. The boy sits back up. He can't watch. A high-pitched cry echoes from the tent, loud enough to dampen the commotion around the rest of the camp. The boy recognizes that scream. It's the same scream he heard when he threw the Play-Doh out of the door. That first brave soldier, defending his brothers in arms from the giant. What had the boy done? The soldier outside the medical tent picks up the phone and informs the tiny soldier's tiny family what had happened. He had lost both his legs, but not his life. He was a hero. The battalion is mobilizing, no time to mourn. Snipers climb the ladder onto the edge of the sandbox and set up nests all along the wooden beam as trucks rumble through the thick grass below. On the other side of the sandbox wall, a desert platoon makes its way through the scorching heat. Soldiers sit atop tanks, shaking the last remaining drops of doughy water from their red bottles and wiping sweat from their brows, all of them heading in the direction of the treehouse. The boy stands up, surrounded by tiny soldiers. He has to be careful where he steps now as they fill the grass around him. A couple of tanks rumble between his feet, flattening the blades of grass as if they were as weak as, well, blades of grass. All of the soldiers, all of the equipment and vehicles, everything is coming from the little ball of red Play-Doh. And little is the right word for it. With every new unit deployed to the front line, the ball shrinks slightly. It's getting smaller and smaller by the minute. They're going to need reinforcements. The boy rushes into the house and returns in just a few seconds, arms laden with Play-Doh. He's got every pot of it from when he was little. He pops them all open, one after the other, and throws them onto the ground in the midst of the camp. The only slight issue is that all the Play-Doh is that gross brown color that it goes when you mix all the colors together. That won't matter, will it? Gunfire breaks out almost immediately below him. The boy jumps back in surprise, stepping on a communications mast by accident. Tiny brown soldiers rush out of the Play-Doh balls all around the camp, diving into cover and opening fire on the red soldiers. It's a massacre. Red soldiers taking a rest from the front line, calling their loved ones, getting ready to go home on leave, lying injured in beds. All of them are gunned down. Most don't even have a chance to grab their rifles. One brave red soldier sprints to the communications mast and tries to radio the rest of the battalion, telling them what's happened, but the mast is destroyed. A stray bullet catches him in the side of his head, and he crumbles to the ground, just a lifeless blob of Play-Doh. The boy watches in horror as a couple of brown soldiers pick up the body and toss it into the nearest ball of brown Play-Doh. A dedicated team of them mix the body in with the rest of the dough until it's that same brown color. From the blob emerges a new brown soldier. The small red streak running across his heart is the only sign that he'd ever been a red at all. The soldier quickly disappears amongst the mass of helmets and boots, trampling any trace of the red army. The whole yard erupts in tiny warfare. The red snipers lining the walls of the sandbox are picked off one after the other. The desert platoon are ambushed by landmines and quickly surrounded, hiding in broken down tanks as plumes of sand are thrown up all around them. Before long, the brown troops have them completely surrounded. One last soldier bursts out from the hatch in his tank, holding grenades in each hand. The bullet catches him in the head before he can even finish his war cry. The grenades explode harmlessly, nowhere near the brown troops. The red convoy, on its way to the tree, stands the best chance of survival. The boy follows them with fascination, watching as the brown army fight their way through the red line from the back, splitting it through the middle as their superior firepower makes short work of the transport and supply trucks. Some red soldiers dive away into the thick grass, climbing up dandelions and weeds in a desperate attempt to escape. Few succeed, as the bodies fall back into the mud like raindrops. A tiny screaming noise fills the yard. The boy turns around just in time to jump out of the way of the brown fighter jets. Five of them streak through the air, almost at his head height. Missiles fire out of the bottom of each jet, one after the other, blowing apart what little remains of the red convoy. The gunfire dies down within the hour. Skirmishes break out across the yard as brown patrols pick off the stragglers they find from the red army hiding in ants' nests, under fallen leaves, and huddling around broken down vehicles. The boy watches as several high-ranking officers gather in the brown base to oversee the absorption of the last of the red ball of Play-Doh. They mold themselves a big meeting table with a brown map of the yard and plot out their strategy for taking the treehouse for themselves, moving around even tinier little model units across the surface of it with sticks. The plan quickly comes together before the boy's eyes and under his feet. A series of mortars and surface-to-air missiles are deployed along the wall of the sandbox. The Air Force takes over the original brown base, chopping down blades of grass and laying out Play-Doh runways flanked with brown hangars. A ring of military units surround the base of the treehouse, strategizing about how best to ascend the colossal structure and reach the flagpole. 
In the pond, an aircraft carrier splashes into the water, marking the arrival of the Navy. The ship is soon flanked by a pair of destroyers armed with anti-aircraft missiles. The boy is about to go over and peer into the water to try and spot a nuclear submarine when he comes across a sight for sore eyes. Red soldiers, not much more than a single squadron, hunkered down around the base of the swing set. They've covered themselves in dirt and little clumps of moss to camouflage. They must be the forwardmost scout squadron, just far enough away from that original convoy to escape the slaughter. But what are they doing? The units are all gathered around a pile of leaves. There's something underneath. What is it? It looks like plastic. Of course, it's his toy bomber with the broken wing. Trying not to draw the attention of the brown army, the boy drops to the ground next to the red units, doing his best to hide in the grass. The red soldiers are arguing amongst themselves. The general is there. He's survived, but barely, slumped against a blade of grass. The scout's high-pitched arguing is a little too quiet for the boy to make out, but it's pretty clear what's going on. They need to get the toy plane working, but it'll be hopeless without the other wing. He lifts his head and looks around the yard. There it is, in the flower bed but it's surrounded by brown troops. How could the red soldiers possibly fight their way to it and get back unharmed? Oh, wait. The boy just gets up, walks over to the flower bed, and picks up the wing. In about three seconds, he completes an insurmountable effort for those little soldiers. Kneeling next to them, he offers the missing wing. The scouts all stand back warily. It's the general who climbs to his feet and walks over to the boy. He looks at the plastic wing, looks up at the giant towering over him, and raises his arm in a salute. The others follow suit quickly and get to work repairing the toy plane. Brown soldiers notice the commotion and start to close in on them. They don't have much time. The boy stamps out a runway for the soldiers in the grass. The plane is almost ready to go, but is missing one vital piece of the propeller. Only there's a bigger problem. They're out of red Play-Doh. A brown soldier breaks through the thick grass and rushes towards the squadron, his assault rifle peppering the side of the plane with doughy bullets. The scouts all dive into the vehicle and kick the engine into gear. Little red gears and pistons were into life beneath the plastic, but the plane just isn't moving without the propeller. What can they do? The brown soldier stops in his tracks, staring at the plane. The boy peers at him closer. There's a red streak across his heart. Conflict contorts the tiny soldier's face. The door to the plane opens, and out steps the general. The two soldiers face each other on the runway, the red scouts desperately calling the general to get back in. None of them move. The brown soldier raises his rifle, and shoots the general in the head. The older man crumples to the ground. Inside the plane, the scouts start to panic. They don't have their guns with them. The brown army is bearing down on them from all sides. What can they do? The brown soldier with the streak across his heart walks slowly over to the general's body, stoops down, and picks him up. He carries the body around to the front of the plane and, without a word, starts using the Play-Doh to build them a propeller. Brown soldiers burst through the grass, swarming the runway. They need to leave, now or never. The brown soldier places the propeller onto the plane and steps aside as the vehicle roars off along the runway. He salutes the ascending plane as one of his brown compatriots puts a bullet in his chest right through his red heart. But the plane is already away, lifting off into the sky. The toy bomber dodges and weaves its way between the whizzing bullets. It banks hard, pulling the nose around inch by inch to face the treehouse. The pilot guns it, pulling the tiny stick back sharply. It seems to take an age for the bomber to climb. The boy glances behind him just in time to see the Brown Navy launch their missiles, six of them, all making a beeline for the bomber. Or so it seems. At the last moment, he sticks a hand out and slaps the missiles out of the air. A couple of them explode, leaving streaks of brown Play-Doh on his hand. The others spiral to the ground, where tiny soldiers dive for cover. The Brown Air Force scrambles, but it's too late. As the jets shoot across the yard, the bomber has already reached its destination. The scouts jump out, deploying red Play-Doh parachutes as they circle their way down onto the flagpole. A jet catches up to the bomber and blows it out of the sky. The scouts don't have time to mourn their lost pilot, or any of their dead for that matter. Quick as they can, they cut the American flag free. As it flutters and floats down to the grass, the squadron unfurls its replacement. A red rectangle of Play-Doh, barely a couple of inches across. One of them pulls a bugle from his pack and plays the highest pitch version of the last post you could ever hear. The whole battlefield falls silent to listen. The boy places a hand over his heart just as the first drop of rain hits his shoulder. From somewhere inside, his mom's voice calls. It's about to start raining. Come inside before you catch a cold. I'm making cocoa. The boy grins and runs into the house. Outside, the rain pours and all trace of the war washes away into red and brown streaks in the dirt.
And with that, you'd be forgiven for thinking that SCP-705 had never even been in that young boy's backyard. Most adults would just dismiss the boy's afternoon entertainment as a figment of a child's imagination, but most adults have not encountered SCP-705, otherwise known as Militarized Play-Doh. The results of a redacted megacorporation's research into creating a self-molding product, the specific mechanics of how this militarized Play-Doh was created are hazy to say the least. What is known is that the small red blob of what appears to be the popular children's sculpting toy exhibits aggressive militaristic tendencies. As soon as the 5-ounce pot is opened, SCP-705 activates, forming itself into miniature Play-Doh soldiers. Each unit comes dressed in detailed and accurate military fatigues, carrying miniaturized weaponry and equipment, all of which function identically to their real-life counterparts aside from one small detail. Everything is made entirely from Play-Doh. When active, SCP-705 can divide into hundreds of infantrymen, each of which seems to have some level of personal autonomy. As of yet, no hive mind mentality has been observed between the soldiers. They all communicate as their real-life military equivalents would, through barking orders, strategizing, and working together. Upon activation, each instance of SCP-705 is highly territorial, seeking to take immediate control of the nearest location or object that seems to be of strategic importance. This could be anything from a coffee machine to a treehouse. What appear to be innocuous household objects to us pose an incredible tactical advantage to the tiny soldiers, many of whom are willing to sacrifice their lives to take control. The longer this militarized Play-Doh is allowed to roam free, the more advanced the military unit becomes. Leadership figures emerge, battle plans grow more and more advanced, and technology improves. While the Play-Doh may initially take the form of a handful of infantry units, if left to their own devices, these units will soon be riding on the backs of tanks, firing miniguns through the doors of attack helicopters, or even developing rudimentary navies and air forces. And of course, you have seen what happens when SCP-705 comes into contact with a regular pot of Play-Doh. The otherwise harmless putty will take on the same characteristics as this militarized Play-Doh. If the two groups of soldiers are the same color, they will form an alliance. If they are different colors, well, that's where the fun begins. Containing SCP-705 is relatively straightforward. Simply gathering all of the Play-Doh together and putting it back into its 5-ounce pot with the lid closed will neutralize the tiny army entirely. This, coupled with how harmless the tiny, doughy bullets are, means that SCP-705 requires little security. It is housed in Sector 2 safe SCP containment with the lid closed. The only accidental outbreak that has occurred since its containment has been in the break room when a researcher accidentally left the lid open while they went to the bathroom. When the researcher returned, all they needed to do to rescue their coffee from the clutches of a crazed Play-Doh general was brush a few soldiers off the counter. This is a day SCP-705 still talks about often with deep fear and reverence. A firefighter is running through a burning apartment building. The air is thick with black smoke as burning debris crashes down around him. In the chaos, he's been split up from the rest of his crew. They've probably already exited the structure, and based on the conditions, he probably should too. But just as the firefighter turns to head back down the stairs, he hears something. There are cries coming from a room down the hall. The firefighter runs to the door. There's definitely someone inside. He can hear their voice as they cry for help. I'm coming, the firefighter yells. But when he tries to open the door, it won't budge. He backs up and throws his body against it, again and again and again until finally, the door bursts open. A wave of heat and smoke hits the firefighter, but he can see who is crying for help. There, across the room, hiding halfway under the bed, is a young girl. She's clutching a stuffed rabbit and crying with fear. The firefighter takes a step towards her, but he can feel the floor start to give way and has to step back. It will never support his weight. He'll need the girl to crawl to him. It's her only chance. He beckons for the girl to come to him as more flaming debris rains down. The little girl starts to crawl towards him, slowly at first, but then faster. She's almost to him when there's a loud crack. The fireman can only watch as the floor collapses beneath the little girl, and she falls. But suddenly, she stops. The fireman can't believe it. Her shirt has caught on a damaged pipe, and she hangs in the air as her stuffed rabbit is swallowed up in the flames below. The fireman reaches out for the little girl as she extends her hand towards his. They both stretch as far as they can, just a little further. They're almost touching, almost there. Just as their fingertips touch, the rest of the floor gives way, and they both fall. 
Outside, multiple crews man hoses and fight against the blaze, trying to contain the fire which is quickly getting out of control. There is a cry from one of the teams, and the men start running as a large portion of the building collapses. Was anyone still in there? Where's John? The fire chief asks anyone he can find, but no one has seen him. Just then, in the entrance of the building, a figure appears, silhouetted against the flames. It's John. He steps out of the burning building. His suit looks like it has been completely melted by the flames. Somehow, he's alive. But he's alone. As the other firefighters rush to help him, he looks like he is in a daze. They ask him what happened, if there's anyone else inside who might still be able to make it out. But he can only stare at them. A few weeks later, John is sitting in the firehouse. His fellow firefighters can still hardly believe that he made it out of that inferno unscathed. But while the fire miraculously didn't touch his body, it seems to have made an impression in other ways. He's once again at a table with numerous papers spread in front of him. One of the other firemen from his crew starts teasing him about working on one of his projects yet again. What is it this time? Is he doing his monthly budget again, checking credit card statements for fraudulent charges? John is working on his retirement plan, actually. That fire may have shown him that life can be cut quite short, but it also taught him that it's important to get your life in order so that the time you do spend on this earth is well spent. The fireman is laughing at John's newfound fiscal responsibility when the bell starts to chime. No more jokes, it's time to suit up and get out. The firefighters arrive at another large structure fire. A man rushing out of the building tells them between coughs that there's still people inside. The firemen don't hesitate and head into the building. They search the second floor and see a door with smoke billowing out from underneath it. John checks the door for heat and gives a thumbs up. They open the door and head inside. The smoke is so thick that neither of them can see much of anything. But then, through the smoke, they spot something. A woman is lying on the floor. They both step towards her when a beam comes crashing down from the ceiling. They both leap out of the way, and the fireman barely escapes being crushed. He stands up and asks if John is okay, but no response. He quickly looks around, but he can't see him. It's as if he just vanished. But there's no time to figure out what happened. He scoops up the woman, who coughs as he picks her up. She's still alive. As the fireman exits the building with the woman, she appears to have completely regained consciousness. The chief approaches them, but the fireman can only shake his head as if to say, John didn't make it this time. The woman who was rescued from the fire is in the hospital. The doctors can hardly believe it, but she tells them she's fine, and x-rays of her lungs show that there's nothing wrong at all. It's as if she hadn't just been carried out of a building where multiple civilians and firefighters were killed. The doctor tells her that they'll need to run a couple more tests, but if those come back clear, then he doesn't see any reason to hold her. As he is leaving her room, though, he stops and turns to her with one last thing. She has some visitors. The woman seems confused. As the doctor exits the room, a group of several people in dark black suits walk in. They look like FBI or CIA agents, but they don't have any badges. Good afternoon, ma'am. We're from the SCP Foundation. We've been looking for you. As the Foundation agents took this young woman into custody, researchers were already preparing a containment cell for her. Though once she got there, she would have a new name, SCP-069. This anomaly is a humanoid entity, though its exact appearance can vary dramatically thanks to its bizarre ability. Whenever SCP-069 is left alone with a recently deceased person's body, 069 will acquire its exact appearance. And not only will SCP-069 look like the recently expired individual, it will also take on their physical mannerisms, their voice, and even their patterns of speech, allowing it to look and sound exactly like the person who just passed away. In the same moment that it begins mirroring the person, the corpse will also disappear by a process that Foundation researchers have yet to understand. The body vanishes without a trace, leaving only the new SCP-069 instance alive and well in its place. This doppelganger will be virtually indistinguishable from the original, with even DNA and fingerprint tests coming back as a match for the original. Friends and family will have no idea that an anomalous entity has taken their place, since in addition to taking on all of the physical qualities of the deceased person, SCP-069 will also gain their knowledge and memories. They will act exactly as the person did, with only one single difference setting them apart. Those who are around SCP-069 in the days and weeks after its transformation will notice that the person will suddenly start expressing a strong desire to get their life in order, with that vague phrase relating to any number of potential tasks. 
These can include resolving outstanding obligations in their life, either personal like paying back an owed favor, or financial such as resolving debts or making long-term life plans like opening retirement accounts and updating their last will and testament. They will also often make efforts to visit with extended or estranged family members, rekindle friendships that have been allowed to languish, or other acts of closure, the kind that can build up over a lifetime and are often put off until it is too late. SCP-069 seems to retain no knowledge of its previous impersonations, and it will not carry any memories or abilities from one instance to another, outside of the one recurring desire to make things right in its new form's life. When an identified SCP-069 entity has been asked why it is engaging in this new behavior, it claims to have no ulterior motives besides an overwhelming desire to get their life straightened out since, after all, you never know when an unforeseen injury or death might occur. 069 itself experiences pain, injuries, and death just as a normal human does, but those similarities end at the exact moment they expire. When SCP-069 dies, its body will rapidly decay, turning to dust almost instantly. The Foundation has tried to preserve its body or at least stave off the rapid decomposition, but so far, all attempts have failed. After it has died, SCP-069 will then re-manifest at the site of the most recent human death, regardless of its proximity to where 069 died. There does not appear to be any distance limitation to this ability, and the largest such jump the Foundation has recorded is to a death that was 675 kilometers away from where its previous form died. This anomaly first came into the SCP Foundation's radar after field agents learned of a firefighter who appeared to miraculously survive an extremely deadly building fire, which claimed the lives of two other firefighters and 11 civilians. The firefighter had walked out of the building unscathed, despite his suit and equipment suffering an amount of damage that their wearer should not have been able to survive. Roughly three weeks later, the same firefighter responded to another large building fire. He was lost inside a smoky room, and was presumed to have died, despite his body never being recovered. A single civilian was rescued, and much like the firefighter, appeared unharmed, a virtual impossibility given the extremely smoky conditions from which she was saved. An SCP containment team, Mobile Task Force SHE-3, also known as the Body Snatchers, were sent to the hospital where she was recovering the next day, and SCP-069 was identified and taken into Foundation custody for the first time. Containment of this particular anomaly would prove to be quite tricky though, especially when its abilities were not fully understood. Several years after its initial capture, a guard assigned to SCP-069's cell was killed during a containment breach by another SCP, and the proximity of the guard's corpse to SCP-069 allowed them to take on their form. Though it was quickly discovered that the jump had taken place, and SCP-069 was returned to containment, they remained insistent that the Foundation was making a mistake and imprisoning one of their own. Over time, though, their protestations waned, and eventually, SCP-069 became relatively compliant and cooperative with staff. That is, until a huge mistake was made that would necessitate a drastic change to its containment procedures. A junior researcher who was assigned to 069 accidentally let slip that the agent's family had been informed of their untimely death. This seemed to greatly distress 069, and they reacted to the news by attempting to commit suicide. It's unknown what exactly triggered this response, since just being told that they were an imposter did not appear to have this effect in the past. But something about the family learning of the original person's death seems to have a profound impact on SCP-069. Following this event, SCP-069 has been placed on suicide watch, and plans to use other recently deceased SCP Foundation employees as possible targets for its ability have been suspended. SCP-069 continues to live in the form of its former guard, and is housed at Humanoid Containment Site 06-3. It continues to insist that it actually is the deceased agent, and still expresses a desire to get its life in order. Despite looking, sounding, and acting exactly as the former Foundation agent, it is not to be treated as if it is that person, no matter how tempting it may be for former friends and co-workers of the departed to have one last visit. If SCP-069 ever attempts to or is successful in breaching containment, it is to be subdued using non-lethal methods. Should SCP-069 die while in containment, Foundation agents are to closely monitor any reports of incidents where it appears that someone has somehow escaped certain death, a telltale sign that the person is now actually SCP-069. In the meantime, 
The Foundation will continue to study this strange anomaly, which has been classified as safe. And though we may never fully understand its abilities, perhaps there's something we can learn from it when it comes to second chances. It's one o'clock in the morning on a work night, and the last of the bar hoppers and club goers have long since turned in. At the end of the street, the last bar is finally closing down for the night. Or it would, except that the bartender is having trouble getting rid of a customer. Sitting at the bar, an old derelict is demanding yet another drink. The bartender grumbles in annoyance. This derelict is sloppy drunk, and the bartender just wants to go home. Closing time, growls the bartender. Just one more, protests the derelict, shaking his empty glass for emphasis. I've got money. He laughs at his own words, his giggles ending with a loud belch that blows a cloud of aromatic vapor into the bartender's face. That's it. This derelict has been hanging out at this bar causing trouble all night, and the bartender has had enough. Get out of here, says the bartender as he hustles the wobbling derelict out the door. You're done. The derelict creaks and totters as he stumbles out into the street. The night's festivities are really hitting him. It isn't so often that he's got the money to burn, but when he does, he likes to spend it here. The prices are right, and the conversation is minimal, which is just the way that he likes it. The derelict turns around, fire in his eyes. He's raring to fight, and he doesn't care that the bartender is quite a bit larger than he is. Right now, all he can see is red. Don't tell me why I've had enough, he slurs, raising his fists as he prepares to lash out. But the bartender has already slammed the door in his face. Defeated, the derelict turns his back on the closed bar and starts a slow stumble down the street. Stupid bartender, mutters the derelict, turning up his collar against the cold bite of the night air. He wishes that he just had one more drink to warm his stomach against the chill. He's so out of it that he doesn't stop to think that the bartender did him a favor by refusing to fight. There is no way that the derelict would have won that battle. Even if he was in his physical prime, even if the bartender wasn't twice his size, the derelict is in no shape to fight. His vision is blurry and his head is swimming. In fact, he can barely remain upright. If he had any sense, he would probably stumble home and sleep this off. But the night is young and he's not ready to give up yet. He walks down the street, eyeing every storefront in hopes of finding another bar. Unfortunately, every window has a closed sign in it. He swears under his breath. What a run of bad luck. What's a guy supposed to do in this town, he wonders. Just when he's about to give up hope, he spies something glinting in the reflective halo of a street lamp. He stumbles closer to get a better look, and he can hardly believe his eyes. Finally, his luck is changing. Someone has abandoned a half-empty bottle. Well, hello there, little friend says the derelict. He struggles to focus, but the world is spinning. In his confusion, he could swear he's seeing things. But no, he can feel the heft of the glass bottle in his hand, and he knows that it is as real as he is. Who left you behind? Who would leave a perfectly good bottle just sitting out here? He recognizes this brand. There's only about three fingers of liquid left, but that's better than nothing. Some people might balk at drinking out of a random bottle that you found on the street, but the derelict doesn't give it a second thought. He tips the bottle back and slurps it all down. It burns going down, just as it should, he thinks. He sighs in contentment as he feels the harsh liquid warm his stomach. Perfect. That really hit the spot. But what happens next surprises him so much that he can't believe his eyes. There's still liquid in the bottle. He blinks, wondering if maybe his adult brain is playing tricks on him. But he shakes the bottle cautiously and is rewarded with a telltale swish of liquid. That's no illusion. He takes another swig, guzzling it down. Normally, he'd drop the bottle to the ground and stumble on, but something makes him pause. He maintains his grip on the bottleneck and raises it again to take another look. And sure enough, there's still more left in the bottle. The derelict cannot believe his luck. He feels like he must have won the lottery. He's found a never-ending bottle. Already, his mind is reeling with possibilities. That bartender really thinks he's so smart, he mutters to himself as he weaves unsteadily. I don't need him anymore. See if I ever go to this stupid bar again. He just lost his best customer. Now that I have you, little bottle, I don't ever need to pay for drinks ever again. <laughs> it's the best day of my life, crows the derelict, raising his arms in triumph. He's barely able to stagger back to his home, a seedy apartment on the bad side of town, before he passes out on the floor. The morning sun rouses the slumbering derelict, and he rises with a groan. His whole body aches, and his mouth feels dry and parched. That's par for the course after a night of drinking. But somehow this hangover feels different. He puts that thought out of his mind as his mind returns to the strange, never-empty bottle that he discovered the night before. 
It's lying on its side on the floor next to him. He reaches for the mysterious bottle, only to find that, in fact, the previous night was not a dream. The bottle still contains just as much as it did the night before. He can't explain it, but the derelict isn't about to question his good fortune. He lifts himself to his feet and walks slowly into the bathroom. He's feeling a hangover like he's never felt before. His head is pounding and his throat is dry. His tongue feels swollen and sluggish inside his mouth, but he knows how to handle it. A little hair of the dog is all you need to help with the hangover. He takes another gulp from his bottle, but this time it brings little relief. And he notices something else strange too. It's his scalp. The skin on his head has started to itch and he can't stop scratching. He feels like he's got the world's worst dandruff problem. He should probably take a shower, he thinks. He strips down and steps into the tub, turning the hot water on full blast and letting it wash over him. The shower only brings him temporary relief. Afterward, as he dries himself off, the towels feel rough and abrasive against his skin. His skin comes off in big flaky patches and his nails leave red trails in their wake. What's that? Is that blood? He examines his fingers to see that his nails have grown into ragged claw-like talons. With a frightened yelp, he bites them off. It's easy to do. Although they look formidable, his fingernails are weak and brittle, almost as if he's dealing with a sudden calcium deficiency. What could be wrong with him? He remembers all the warnings he heard back in school when they used to march everyone into assembly to listen to lectures from the local police. At the time, he scoffed at the long lists of scary-sounding consequences of a lifetime of drinking, but now he's not so sure. It's probably nothing, he says as he examines himself in the bathroom mirror. His skin looks blotchy and infected. It doesn't take long before his hair and nails are out of control. His hair grows down to his shoulders, but comes out in big ragged clumps if he runs his fingers through it. His claw-like fingernails are constantly breaking and cracking until his fingertips are bloody, and his quick is itchy and infected. If his habits had left him looking worse for wear before, he really looks awful now. For the next week, he barely leaves the apartment. He pulls the curtains and keeps the lights off, afraid that someone might see him. When the landlord bangs on the door, shouting that rent is late and demanding that the derelict hand over the money, he doesn't answer. He waits. The landlord gives up for now. That's good, thinks the derelict. It will give him time to think, time to figure out what to do about his disease. He knows that something is not right. Many of the local bartenders are, by now, probably wondering where he's gone. It's not like the derelict to stay away. He's practically kept the bar industry in this town afloat all by himself. It must be something major indeed to keep him away from his favorite poison. Luckily, he still has the bottomless bottle to comfort him during this trying time. The derelict is certain that he's caught some bad bug, but he thinks that he can wait it out. All he needs to do is make it through the next week and everything will be fine. Sipping free drinks helps him to pass the time in a pleasant stupor as he waits for his health to return. Unfortunately, things are only going to get worse for him. His hair and fingernails keep growing, to the point that he has trouble lifting the bottle without his twisted nails getting in the way. His dry, flaky skin is changing as well, becoming thick and leathery and hanging off him in great folds like the hide of an elephant or a rhinoceros. His skin continues to grow, until the folds flop over his knees and gradually hang lower and lower until they touch the ground. Moving is harder now that he's carrying so much extra weight. He thought at first he just had a nasty bug, but he's clearly picked up some weird skin condition, and even this derelict, sodded as he might be, suspects exactly where he got it. It's got to be that crazy bottomless bottle. He can't think of another reason. Even so, he can't bring himself to part with this little gift from heaven. Even in his darkest hour, a few sips of liquid courage always helps to calm his nerves. He considers lumbering down to the free clinic in hopes that they might be able to cure him or at least tell him what's wrong with his skin. But he thinks better of this option. What if he's got some weird alien parasite that no one has ever seen before? They might lock him away in some government lab or something. No, he reasons, it's better to wait it out. He'll sleep it off, swear off the sauce for a little while, and maybe it'll pass. In desperation, the derelict drags himself across the floor, hoping to at least find some solace away from human contact. He locks himself into his bedroom while he's still able to manipulate the lock on his door. The extra folds of skin are hanging off of his hands and arms, making it hard to do anything. The extra skin is so heavy that he can't walk much carrying all that extra weight. He lies on the floor of his bedroom, away from everything, and hopes that tomorrow, when he wakes up, this will just be a fading dream. The only thing that brings him solace is the never-ending bottle, which even now in his advanced state of decay, he keeps close by him. After all, he reasons, the damage is already done. What could possibly be the harm in enjoying a nice drink? A week later, his condition has not passed. 
the landlord is back, and this time he's not taking no for an answer. The landlord isn't supposed to enter his tenant's apartment without permission, but he doesn't care. He uses his own key to unlock the door and go inside. The condition of the apartment is appalling. The furniture is broken, the floor is covered with unidentifiable filth, and there's a rotten stench in the air. The landlord wants to throw up as the full weight of the musty smell hits him in the face. It's as if someone has been living in here without any ventilation, with all the windows firmly closed and sealed. A sudden noise from the bathroom draws his attention. Of course, thinks the landlord, that old bum is hiding in there. He thinks I won't find him. The landlord steals his resolve and heads towards the bathroom, determined to get the money that he feels is owed to him. But what greets him when he steps through the door isn't the derelict anymore. It isn't even human. The creature in the bathroom is a massive pile of ambulatory skin folds. The skin flaps have grown so large and cumbersome that the derelict within can barely move. They sprout all over his body, covering him so that he looks more like some kind of alien sea cucumber now than any human. The landlord stumbles backwards, screaming in terror at the sight, unable to comprehend what he's looking at. Improbably, the creature reacts to the noise, and a ripple of movement spreads across its surface. It starts to move, despite not having any legs. The landlord is so terrified that he doesn't notice the glass bottle that suddenly drops from between the creature's skin folds as it starts to move toward him. The same bottle, still with three fingers of liquid inside. How could something like this happen? What parasite or disease did the derelict contract from the miracle bottle he found? Sadly, this never-ending bottle isn't a boon, but a curse, and the man who found it that night became just another victim of what the SCP Foundation has classified as SCP-420. SCP-420 looks like a perfectly ordinary bottle of a certain popular libation, even to the point that it bears the label of a common brand. The bottle always contains a small amount of a mysterious liquid known as SCP-420-1. If this liquid is poured out, SCP-420 will always replenish itself. When SCP-420-1 is potent, it is physically, chemically, and molecularly indistinguishable from ordinary whiskey, although drinking will have an effect far greater than even the strongest liquor. When SCP-420-1 is poured out of SCP-420, though, it undergoes a strange transformation, eventually losing its potency and changing until it is indistinguishable physically, chemically, or molecularly from urine. Consuming potent SCP-420-1 instigates a bizarre physical transformation called SCP-420-2 in six stages. In stage one, beginning 12 hours after consumption, the subject will start to have difficulty speaking, resulting in slurred speech that is not consistent with normal alcohol inebriation. Their fingernails, toenails, and hair will start to grow at an accelerated rate, but also become brittle and prone to breakage. Nail breakage to the quick often leads to bleeding and infection. The Foundation has had some success in curing SCP-420-2 if it is caught when still in stage 1, treating it as if it is an aggressive form of cancer with radiation and chemotherapy as well as a constant intravenous supply of Formula 420A09T-T174B. Victims thus treated have a 73% recovery rate, but a 21% fatality rate. From Phase 2 onward, this protocol can slow the spread of SCP-420-2, but will not stop it entirely. In Stage 2, beginning 1-2 to two weeks after Stage 1, the subject's skin begins to show similar properties to those exhibited by hair and fingernails in Stage 1, becoming dry, brittle, and prone to cracking. As old skin flakes off, the subject's new skin begins to grow at an accelerated rate, eventually forming thick leathery folds all over the subject's body. Skin flaps growing inside the mouth interfere with speech and eventually render subjects mute, but do not appear to impede breathing or eating. Indeed, subjects in Stage 2 exhibit a renewed interest in eating, possibly because the subject's body requires additional nutrients and calories to build the increasingly heavy armor of thickened, calloused skin. Stage 2 subjects will eat anything that they can get their hands on, and many die after attempting to eat poisonous or inedible objects. In Stage 3, beginning 3-6 to six weeks after Stage 2, nerves in the skin layer grow uncontrollably, but no longer connect to the victim's central nervous system. Genetic testing of the skin in this stage reveals that its DNA has become so mutated that it can no longer be classified as human. It is, in fact, a separate and very inhuman organism that almost acts as a parasite growing from the human host. The skin may develop tumor-like growths, which appear to be analogous to human muscle and secretory cells. Hair and fingernails sprout randomly from the mass of skin. By stage 4, beginning 3-7 to seven days after stage 3, 
the skin has become a mass of thick, leathery folds, completely covering the human host to the point that they disappear completely. The skin begins to exhibit random twitching movements, as though it is indeed a living organism finally coming into its own as a life form and testing out its new body. The human subject within the skin continues to eat, although brain scans reveal that they are no longer in control of their mouth. Instead, the skin entity forces the mouth to move by moving the attached skin. Small holes begin to form in the skin, eventually growing into narrow tunnels or throats that lead back to the now-trapped body of the helpless subject. The subject is still consumed with a ravenous hunger and will eat anything that they can get in their mouth. In stage 5, beginning one to two days after stage 4, the skin begins to move in patterns indicating rudimentary intelligence. The skin, although still attached to the original subject, is now completely and distinctly non-human. It is its own organism. It can move of its own accord, dragging the trapped host along for the ride, and it moves and feeds much in the manner of an extremely large amoeba. It feeds by excreting a digestive enzyme onto foodstuffs and then enveloping the nutrients with its skin folds, again like an amoeba surrounding its food. The food is taken into the throats. These tunnels connecting the outside of the skin to the now completely subsumed host are now directly connected to the host's circulatory system and function as additional mouths. They can consume nutrients which are moved down their length by bristly hairs and further broken down by grinding keratinous plates before being taken into the host's body. Most hosts will remain in stage 5 indefinitely, although there still remains a much more dangerous stage 6 yet to come. At this time, it's unknown what factor triggers SCP-420-2 to develop into stage 6. Little information about stage 6 is available at this time, although it is known that it involves even more accelerated skin and keratin growth, resulting in a sudden increase in size and mass. Perhaps the most terrifying part of the entire transformation is that the host remains alive for the duration of the process, and sometimes even after SCP-420-2 has settled comfortably into its new life at stage 5. Mercifully, most hosts will have completely succumbed to insanity by this point, although some are shown by brain scans to still be self-aware and quite calm, perhaps fading into a zen-like state as they accept the inevitability of their fate. SCP-420 is contained in a storage locker at an undisclosed site maintained by the Foundation, and it is only to be removed from this locker by SCP staff with level 3 clearance or higher. It has been given the safe class because, despite the horrifying nature of its effects, at least it doesn't move anywhere. Samples of SCP-420-1 not in use by testing should be stored in the container marked SCP-420-1 Decon in Locker 1014-420 until they lose potency, at which time they can be disposed of as biohazardous liquid waste. Victims infected with SCP-420-2 are not contagious and should be contained in standard solitary D-Class secure confinement. On reaching Phase 3, subjects should receive double rations. Due to the extreme danger of Phase 6, any subjects who reach Phase 4 should be closely monitored for signs that the condition may be advancing further, in which case they are to be immediately destroyed by incineration. Knowing the fate that befalls victims of SCP-420 should make anyone think twice about drinking out of a random bottle that you just found in the street, though personally, I think that's just common sense. I hope you enjoyed this anomaly, which was recommended by Dr. Bob Squad researcher Lawman23. It's late on a Saturday night in New York City, 11.55 p.m. to be exact. A man is running towards the subway station on 59th Street. He's just gotten off from work at the restaurant where he waits tables, and he's in a hurry to get home and spend some time with his girlfriend. As he approaches the station, he notices something strange. Someone has placed a wooden barrier in front of the entrance. The man has never seen something like this before, but he hasn't lived in Brooklyn very long. Everything about the station looks normal behind the barrier, and he's in a hurry. He doesn't want to have to go several blocks to the next station, so he hops the barrier. What's the worst that could happen? As the man walks onto the train platform, he starts to second-guess his decision. The platform is empty, and come to think of it, he hasn't seen anyone in the station at all. Maybe he did make a mistake. Maybe the station really is closed for repairs. He turns around to leave, but just as he does, he hears a train. Good. Everything is normal. He checks his watch. 11.57 p.m. on the dot. The train comes to a stop, and its doors slide open. It looks a little older than the trains he usually rides, but it appears to be in perfect shape, and it's going the direction of his home, so he steps on board. Just like the station and the platform, there's no one else on the train. Strange. 
but he's ridden nearly empty trains before, especially late at night, though usually at this time on a Saturday there's at least a few people on board. Just then, he hears something in the station. He turns to see someone running down the platform crying out. Stop! Stop! The man in the mass transit authority vest cries, dropping what looks to be his dinner on the platform as he runs. While the MTA worker is still several feet away, the doors snap shut and the train begins to move. The MTA worker cries out again to stop, but he knows there's no point. He watches as the train heads down the tracks and disappears into the darkness. With a sigh, he takes out a walkie-talkie and it squawks to life. We've lost another one, he says. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-052, also known as the Time Traveling Train. SCP-052 appears to be a standard-looking Type R4 New York City subway train. Official city records state that the train was built in 1932 and decommissioned for scrap in 1975. Despite the fact that it should no longer exist, SCP-052 continues to appear on the Uptown AD track at the 59th Street and 8th Avenue station at exactly 11.57 p.m. every Saturday night. The train appears to be in perfect condition just the same as when it was built over 80 years ago, and it is marked as an A-train. Each Saturday, the train arrives at exactly the same time, opens its doors to accept or discharge passengers for precisely five minutes, then closes its doors and disappears until the next week. Where did the train come from? And where does it go in between the weekly appearances? These are questions the SCP Foundation is trying to answer. But perhaps the most frightening aspect of SCP-052 is that once you get on the train, there's no guarantee of ever getting off. Sadly, the majority of subjects that have been observed boarding SCP-052 have not been heard from again. The rare few that have been recovered claim to have boarded the train on various dates, ranging from 1976 all the way to the year 2204, with the latter claiming he thought he was boarding a special 300th anniversary train. Thus far, none of the recovered passengers have reported any memories or knowledge of their time on board the train between entering and exiting. Any passengers spotted disembarking from SCP-052 are to be immediately brought to Site-21 for questioning to determine their origin and assess whether they pose any threat to the current time stream. The Foundation has had great success administering Class A amnestics to passengers who arrived from the past and reintegrating them into society. But any passenger who is identified as being from the future must be held indefinitely to prevent potential disruptions to this reality's time stream. Per Order 69-A1 from O5 Council Member O5-9, there are currently 26 recovered passengers being held at Site 21 who fit this description, and there are not yet any procedures in place that would allow for their safe release into modern society, nor has there been any workable theories for how to return them to their original home time. Despite the protocols in place to prevent public access, some passengers from the present have still managed to accidentally board SCP-052, and subjects from other times continue to appear. Following interviews, it's been discovered that some of these subjects arrive from alternate timelines and realities. This raises the question of whether it is possible for SCP-052 to appear in other times and places, which may require the containment of additional locations and reports of any suspicious activity involving unscheduled trains are being monitored and investigated around the world. Following its initial discovery, several tests were attempted in order to better understand the anomalous train and what may be happening when it is no longer visible. The first test took place on May 31, 2009. An agent was told to simply board the train. They did as requested and have yet to be recovered as of the present date. A second test took place a week later on June 6, this agent, too, was never recovered, though reports indicate that he may have returned to our timeline in 1980, at which point he was killed in a confrontation that has since been classified. A third test was conducted the next week on June 13th. Once again, the agent was told to board the train and did so. This time, though, the agent returned. Just two weeks later, on June 27th, the agent stepped back off the train, with his hands appearing to have been surgically removed. A note had been placed in his pocket that had the simple message, Send No More, written on it. The agent claims not to remember any of his experiences on the train over the two weeks he was gone, or what may have happened to his hands. Following this third test, 
O5 Command issued orders stopping the use of Foundation agents as passengers on SCP-052. D-Class, due to their disposable nature as convicted felons and death row inmates, were considered as potential replacements for the agents in the exploration of SCP-052, but the risk of releasing them into the past, or the future, was determined to be too great. Other than the agent who knowingly boarded the train, several other notable passengers have been recovered. One case involved the recovery of a woman who entered the train on July 14, 2012, but was recovered four years earlier, on March 8, 2008. She entered the train while on her way home from the theater, and was surprised to learn she traveled four years into the past. Because another version of her existed at the time she was recovered, she was held to prevent unwanted temporal effects. Another subject was recovered in 2008 who claimed to be from the year 1976. Although there was nothing physically wrong with him and no risk of time stream disruptions, Foundation psychiatrists recommended that he be held indefinitely, as 32 years was believed to be too long a period of time to successfully reintegrate into society. Perhaps the most interesting recovery was of a man claiming to be a Level 4 supervisor from the SCP Federation, who boarded the train in December of 2124. He said that he had been administered a Class A amnestic prior to boarding, and remembered nothing until his recovery in 2010. While the agent can clearly never be released into society, O5 Command has approved the sharing of classified information about various anomalies, in the hopes that he can provide additional information on possible containment procedures. Because SCP-052 has so far proven impossible to stop or remove from the New York City subway system, it has been classified as Euclid but its predictable nature means that the Foundation is usually able to prevent the public from encountering it. The 59th Street ABCD station is closed to the public between 11 p.m. on Saturday night and 1 a.m. on Sunday morning, under the pretext of track maintenance. Any passengers seen leaving SCP-052 must be taken to Site-21 for debriefing and processing, and members of the public who simply see SCP-052 may be released after the administration of a Class B amnestic. As for what happens to most of the passengers who board SCP-052 and are never seen from again, we simply don't know. A violent storm rocks a merchant ship back and forth. Huge waves roll over the deck and threaten to capsize the vessel. A merchant sailor grips the railing, trying with all his might not to be thrown overboard. With a loud twang, a cable snaps loose. A hand suddenly grabs his shoulder. He turns around with a fright to see that it's one of his shipmates. He points towards the bow of the ship and yells over the roar of the storm that they need to try and repair it. The two men make their way to the front of the ship and the sailor starts working to fix the broken cable. He looks up to see that his mate is no longer working. He's staring straight past him and there's fear in his eyes. The sailor turns around to see a massive tentacle sticking out of the sea. The huge appendage is mind-boggling in its size. He can only stand there, marveling at it, until it begins violently smashing against the deck. The sailor dives out of the way just before the tentacle crashes down right where he was standing, where his crewmate was still locked in fear. The ship is in chaos as more tentacles appear and slam the deck over and over. One cracks the deck right next to him, sending him flying. He comes to moments later in a wreckage pile. Nothing else has changed, though. Whatever this monster is, it's not stopping its assault on the ship. The sailor stands up and picks up a sharpened piece of wood from the pile he was lying in. He runs over to the nearest tentacle and thrusts the sharpened stick into its flesh. There's a mighty roar from the sea, and the tentacles stop their onslaught. They go limp before sliding into the sea. The sailor looks around at the carnage that's been wrought. Dead bodies and debris litter the deck. He moves to check on his crewmates when right in front of him, bursting from the sea, is the head of the biggest squid he has ever seen, a massive beast that must be a thousand meters long. Whatever he had seen before of this creature was truly just the tip of the iceberg. With another roar, the creature lifts up out of the water and wraps its arms around the ship. The sailor only has time to duck down and close his eyes before the entire ship is pulled down beneath the waves. With a gasp, the sailor breaks the surface, screaming and gulping for air. He's alone now, treading water in the middle of the ocean during a storm, but not for long. 
The squid reappears, its head slowly rising out of the water just in front of him. Its head, the size of a house, has two giant, uncaring black eyes that seem to both see him and not. It extends a tentacle toward him as it leans back in the water, exposing its huge, beaked mouth. It wraps its powerful arms around him and starts to pull him towards it, when suddenly, there's an explosion. The squid has been struck by something. Both the sailor and the creature turn to see the most incredible thing. A battleship is coming towards them, slowly rising out of the ocean as if it were somehow submerged, and it's firing on the creature. The squid drops him and starts heading towards the ship. This is going to be a battle for the ages. While this sailor had no idea what he was witnessing, the SCP Foundation was all too familiar. This was yet another incident of SCP-2846, also known as The Squid and the Sailor. But first, a quick personal request from me. I need your help to spread the word about the lesser-known anomalies in the SCP Foundation's archives. The best thing you can do to help me is subscribe, turn on notifications, and then go tell your friends to do the same. This is a huge help and will let me bring you more and more SCP anomalies. Now back to our file. SCP-2846 is the name given to a set of phenomena that occur in the Gulf Atlantic region. These phenomena consist of interactions between two entities, known as SCP-2846-A and SCP-2846-B. 2846-A is a gigantic, aquatic creature that resembles a cephalopod, though no similar organism has been discovered that is even close to approaching its size, with estimates placing 2846-A at being at least 950 meters in length. This creature appears in areas of deep water during storms and will attack civilian vessels, especially cruise ships and merchant vessels. These attacks are sporadic and follow no known patterns other than that they take place during inclement weather. They are sudden and without warning and will nearly always result in the complete destruction of the targeted vessel if they're not intercepted. Attempting to stop these attacks is SCP-2846-B, a large seafaring vessel that in its current form resembles a Pennsylvania-class super dreadnought battleship, though it appears hazy in photos and videos, as if translucent, and eyewitness observers have described the ship as looking vaporous. Just like SCP-2846-A, this ship will appear from deep water, surfacing near the site of a 2846-A event. The vessel will fire on the creature, drawing its attention, and the two will then engage in a heated battle. The two will continue fighting until SCP-2846-A is rendered immobile or completely incapacitated, after which it will sink down into the sea. Following its victory, the ship too will then submerge and disappear beneath the waves. SCP-2846-A is believed to have existed for thousands of years, and maybe even older than that. The creature's existence was first recorded in an Icelandic saga from the 13th century, but the Foundation's first documented sighting came in 1905, when an agent working for the Foundation, one Admiral Reginald von Allen, spotted the creature surfacing with a whale wrapped effortlessly in its tentacles. Soon after spotting it, a ship of the line surfaced as well to do battle with the creature. The Admiral tried to signal the crew that he could see on the deck of the ship, but the vessel descended back below the surface before any communication could take place. In 1935, the mysterious ship appeared again, near the SCPS Hildegard, and this time, the anomalous vessel was the one to initiate communication. Some of the crew of the ship, designated as SCP-2846-B1 through B915, came aboard the Foundation ship and engaged in a conversation with Captain Levy Hansen. SCP-2846-B1 identified himself as David Thomas Jones of the Royal Navy, and went on to explain that their ship had been sunk by a monster resembling SCP-2846-A over 300 years in the past. He described how after sinking into the darkness of the sea, he awoke on a mysterious shore where he met with a woman who referred to herself as Calypso, the goddess of the sea. She explained how she had sealed the leviathans that prowled the depths of the ocean in a pit, but that over time, the seal she had placed on it had begun to weaken. A titan had escaped and taken the form of the most deadly creature in the sea, the Kraken. Calypso feared that the creature would attempt to further destroy the seal and release its monstrous brethren, a disaster that would result in the end of all human life. She requested that Jones pursue the creature along with his crew for as long as needed, and in return, they would be granted immortality. 
Jones agreed, and his endless battle against the anomaly began that day. The reason he had now come aboard a Foundation ship was directly related to this task. SCP-2846-A had grown more powerful over the years, larger and bolder too. He and his men couldn't die, but many more would if they were no longer able to subdue the beast. He needed something from the SCP Foundation. He needed a bigger boat. Following this conversation, and seeing the value in allowing Jones and his crew to continue their mission, the Foundation commandeered a newly built Pennsylvania-class Super Dreadnought battleship from the U.S. Navy, the USS Montana. The ship was sunk 15 kilometers from a Foundation naval facility in Cuba. 30 hours later, the ship surfaced from the sea, though it was now more heavily armed than the USS Montana had been. As part of the agreement, SCP-2846-B was fitted with an explosive device that is capable of completely destroying the ship should the crew for some reason ever turn their guns on Foundation or other human targets. In 2013, an important discovery was made after a tracker was attached to SCP-2846-A. Deep in the Atlantic, roughly 1,300 nautical miles west of Florida, a depression in the ocean floor with a large iron object on top of it was found. 2846 seems to return to this site over and over, where it has been observed clearing the rocks from the area. And it appears that it is almost finished with its task. The iron plate on top of the depression is nearly exposed. It's not known exactly what's underneath, but whatever it is, it's hot. Very hot, with temperatures near it measured at over 4,000 degrees Celsius. It's feared that whatever the creature is trying to unearth, it would lead to an XK end-of-the-world scenario, and it is imperative that it not be allowed to do so. And there's more bad news when it comes to SCP-2846. In 2014, the Foundation ship SCPS Pristine was pursuing a large underwater organism assumed to be SCP-2846-A, and signaled to 2846-B to surface and dispatch the creature in what had become the normal operating procedure. Something strange happened, though, and the pristine was suddenly struck by a mysterious force. As SCP-2846-B began to engage with the now-surfaced 2846-A, the crew of the pristine reported seeing numerous eyes appearing and disappearing in the water below the ship. They had never seen anything like it. The ship was struck again, as satellite images spotted an enormous entity directly beneath the ship. The pristine began taking on water, and the crew was forced to abandon ship. Two other SCP ships in the area fired on the strange, many-eyed entity, causing it to once again disappear into the depths of the ocean, as SCP-2846-B banished 2846-A to the ocean once again. Due to the ongoing danger of SCP-2846-A, it has been classified as Keter. In the event of an appearance, Mobile Task Force Tau-11, also known as the Can Openers, who are stationed aboard the SCPS Nikolai, are to utilize a special transmission device to signal the crew of SCP-2846-B and maintain contact with them throughout their engagement with the creature. Tau-11's primary mission is to minimize civilian exposure to the anomaly, and any non-Foundation ships that come in contact with either 2846 entity are to be moved from the area, and all aboard the craft are to be given Class C amnestics. The SCPS Nikolai's captain has been given permission to fire on SCP-2846-A to assist in the fight. And should 2846B turn hostile for any reason, the explosive device on board is to be detonated. It is still unknown just what the entity that attacked and destroyed the SCPS Pristine was, but the ease with which it dispensed of the vessel has many in the Foundation worried that SCP-2846A has already been able to release one of its brethren from its prison, and at this point, stopping them may no longer be an option. Ouch! The boy on the bus turns around. Did someone pull out one of his hairs? He looks around, but the girl in the seat behind him is staring out the window. She's so quiet and always keeps to herself, he doesn't think it possibly could have been her. The boy turns back around, wondering if he just imagined it, unable to see the small smile forming on the girl's face. The bus stops, and the girl practically sprints off and up the sidewalk to her house. She runs past her mother without saying hello, and goes straight into her bedroom, closing and locking the door behind her. She sits at her desk, opens a drawer, and pulls out a small bag. She reaches into the bag and takes out a folded piece of paper. Congratulations on your purchase of a genuine naughty stalker. Do you love someone but they won't give you the time of day? Do you wish you could hear what they say about you behind their back? Well, wonder no more. 
Using this fantabulous product, you can keep track of your loved one's every move, their every word. The girl imagines herself watching a tiny version of the boy on the bus right here on her desk, seeing everything that he does, listening to his secret thoughts and desires. If only she knew him better, then she'd have the confidence to talk to him and could get him to like her as much as she liked him. She reaches into the bag and pulls out the naughty stalker. It doesn't look like much, just a little doll made from a woven and twisted length of red string. She looks back to the instructions. All you have to do is get a single hair from the head of the object of your desires, slip it under a loose string in our naughty stalker, and see what you've been missing. The girl reaches into her pocket and takes out a single strand of hair. She holds the hair up to the light, looking at it. If this works, it will mean all of her dreams coming true. Just like the instructions said to do, she takes the hair and slides it under a string on the doll's body. She sets the doll down on her desk and waits. And waits. And nothing happens. She picks up the instructions again, turning them over, but there's nothing else except another wonderful product brought to you by blah blah blah. Where were the rest of the instructions on how to get it to work? Why wasn't the doll coming to life? What a piece of junk. What a… wait, what was that? The girl leans in close. Is the doll… breathing? She's startled as the doll turns its head over its shoulder, seemingly looking right at her, or rather, right through her. Coming, mom, the doll shouts before standing up. It starts to walk in place, looking like it is opening invisible doors, and then sitting down on a chair that she can't see. It looks like it's pretending to eat dinner. The girl's eyes widen. The doll is alive. It's really alive. It's actually showing what the boy is doing right now. The naughty stalker has worked. The girl is fascinated by watching the little doll that gives her a peek into her crush's life. She skips her own dinner so she can watch him finish his. She watches as he sits, probably watching TV, takes a shower, and gets ready for bed. It may all just be a little doll acting it out, but it feels like she is there with him. She watches the doll sleep for hours before falling finally asleep herself, her head resting on the desk next to him. The next morning, she passes by the boy and his friend sitting together on the bus and goes to the very back. She gets as low in the seat as she can so no one can see her and takes out the doll, holding it up to her ear. She listens to one side of the conversation as the boy talks about the action movie he watched last night, Weapon of Mass Extinction. The boy talks about how much he liked it and how it's his new favorite movie. This was perfect. It's exactly what she needed. The next day in school, as the boy is putting things into his locker, the girl approaches. She pretends to trip and drops her books in front of him, the books scattering on the floor in front of him. The boy helps her pick them up and notices the DVD she dropped, Weapons of Mass Extinction. She explains that she brought her favorite movie to school to loan it to a friend. What a coincidence that they both happen to love the same film. The boy and the girl, bonding over their love of low-budget sci-fi action films, start spending more and more time together. No one has ever understood him the way that she does. It's as if she has known him for years, even though they've only been friends for a few days. Things move quickly though, and before long, he realizes that he is having romantic feelings for the girl. This is all the girl had ever wanted, and it's all thanks to the naughty stalker. Things are going so well, in fact, that she imagines she won't even need it much longer. But then, something strange happens. She is sure she heard the boy tell his friend that he loved baseball, but when she brings up the idea of going to a game together, the boy looks at her like she was crazy. He hated baseball. After that, things seem to change. The boy is still so nice when they are together. Now it sounds like he is talking about her behind her back. She worries that she has been wrong this whole time, that he has just been messing with her. This stupid doll isn't making her dreams come true. It's making her life a nightmare. But wait, who is the boy talking to? She leans in close to listen. Is he… with another girl? Listening to one side of the conversation, she hears the boy tell someone that this is all just a big joke, a prank he is pulling on some dumb girl. Are they… no, they can't be. Kissing? The girl is in a white-hot rage. She can't believe he would do this to her, after she was nothing but perfect to him. She throws the doll across her room. She's going to confront the boy and whoever he's with. She'll teach him a lesson. She'll teach both of them a lesson. It's starting to rain as the girl gets her bike out and starts to ride to where she knows he is, the spot that was supposed to be their own special place. 
Cars pass close by on the narrow road, splashing her with water, but she doesn't care. She finally reaches the picnic spot where he took her just a few days ago, and she sees a car parked nearby. It must belong to the evil seductress he is with. The girl glares at the car. She grits her teeth until they feel like they might crack. Her fists are clenched so tight that she can't tell if it's the rain or blood from her fingernails digging in that she feels running down her palms. But she doesn't care. She's going to show both of them what happens when you break someone's heart. She takes a step towards the car and... The car that struck her slams on its brakes. The driver gets out and rushes towards her. It's the boy. Her boy. The older couple who were stopped on the side of the road with a flat tire run over to help. The boy gets down next to her and cradles her head in his lap, and they have one last moment to look into each other's eyes before the light fades from hers. Unfortunately for all involved, their lives would never be the same. But how could they have known that they were the victims of an encounter with an anomaly that, while small, is extremely dangerous? One that is known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-693, the Naughty Stalker. SCP-693 are multiple humanoid-shaped dolls, measuring roughly 18 centimeters in length, each made from a single string that is either red, blue, yellow, or black, with onyx beads for eyes. Their clothing will vary in color and style, and seems to have no bearing on the properties of the doll. The string doll will behave exactly as one would expect, showing no anomalous properties at all, until the owner takes the steps that are spelled out in the instructions that always accompany SCP-693. The instruction sheet congratulates the owner on their acquisition of a naughty stalker and explains that in order to use it, a single hair from another person must be inserted into a loop of its string, at which point the doll will attune to that person. The doll will then come alive, mimicking the actions of the hair's owner in real time, including their speech. The doll will perfectly portray the attuned individual for nine days, after which point it will become unreliable. The exact way in which SCP-693 begins changing the speech and actions depends on the color of its base string, but in all cases, its end goal is to drive the current owner of the doll to their death. SCP-693 goes about this by feeding inaccurate information to the owner. Dolls made of red string try to send their owner into increasingly violent fits of rage. Dolls comprised of blue string try to depress the owner and lead them to self-harm. Yellow dolls want to make their owners attempt unwanted acts of physical love, and black dolls encourage their owners to engage in activities and place themselves in situations that are dangerous. Interestingly, SCP-693 will attune not just to the living, but to the deceased as well. When a dead person's hair is placed in a loop of string, the naughty stalker will come to life, just as it does when a living person's is used. But instead of acting out the speech and movements of the person, the attuned doll will claim to be the deceased person and offer to act as a spiritual guide to the owner. But just like with a living person, at the nine-day mark, SCP-693 will become unreliable and will attempt to lead the owner down a path that results in their death. Once an SCP-693 instance is successful in causing its owner's death, a new doll instance will appear and be found on the owner's body. Several of these dolls have been recovered from Naughty Stalker victims, and currently the Foundation has seven red instances, ten blue instances, five yellow instances, and one black instance in its possession. All instances of SCP-693 contained by the Foundation were originally classified as safe and kept in Containment Locker 12C-K, but following the events of Incident 693-E, that classification was revisited. During this incident, a researcher returned a Naughty Stalker doll to its containment locker, but in a lapse of judgment that went against Foundation protocols, they forgot to remove the hair that had been placed in the doll. When the locker was next opened, the dolls were observed to have all been moved. They were found in a circle around the accidentally still-attuned doll, which had been crucified upside down on the wall of the locker. It is unknown where the dolls acquired nails. After this incident, a camera was placed inside of the locker, and the results were… surprising, to say the least. It turns out that SCP-693 instances come to life when they are not observed, even when they aren't attuned. While they have not yet been observed engaging in violent acts against each other, the camera has captured the naughty stalkers appearing to reenact the final 30 minutes of their last owner's life over and over. Following this new information, all instances of Naughty Stalker dolls were moved to their own separate 25 by 25 by 25 centimeter steel containers within the containment locker, and their classification was upgraded to Euclid. 
SCP-693 is one of the rare anomalies where the Foundation actually has quite a good idea as to where it originates, and it was very easy to discover as well. Provided that they aren't a deception, the instructions that appear with each instance of SCP-693 are quite explicit about where they come from. After congratulating the owner on their acquisition and explaining how the doll works, the instructions close by extolling the naughty stalker as yet another wonderful product brought to you by The Factory. For those unaware, The Factory is a place with a long connection to the Foundation, though the details on that will have to wait for another file exploration. All you need to know now is that The Factory produces a huge amount of anomalies, and it appears that SCP-693 is one of them. There are theories that the dolls may have been produced as an espionage tool, but as for why their primary purpose seems to be driving their owner to their death, well that, we simply don't know. What was that? The man and woman's hike through a gently rolling portion of the Rocky Mountains has just taken a turn for the dangerous. There's something there in the bush, the man tells her before stepping in front of her in a defensive pose. They watch the bush intently. There's a slight rustling of the leaves as if something is inside. The man picks up a stick from the ground and holds it in front of him, ready to strike whatever fearsome beast is lurking in the underbrush. The rustling stops, but the man doesn't move from his protective stance. Do you think it's gone? The woman asks. The man isn't sure. He leans in towards the bush, searching for signs of what might be hiding inside when… Ah! The man screams and falls backwards as the creature emerges from the bush. Aw! The woman cries. It's a pika! She kneels down to get a closer look at the adorable little creature. Pikas are native to this part of Colorado, and they resemble rabbits but with small, rounded ears. She watches it hop back off the trail before turning around to see her friend lying tangled in the branches of a tree. She can't help but laugh as she offers a hand to help pull him out of his predicament. Are you alright? She asks between fits of laughter. Yes, he's fine. The only thing hurt was his pride. He notices a small red spot on his arm and rubs it, but it doesn't seem to hurt at all. His attention is diverted by the woman, though, who is marveling at the tree he was just stuck in. Free of the branches, he can appreciate now that the tree really is incredible. It looks like a huge blue spruce, but the name is a complete misnomer, because this tree is a vibrant red color. I've never seen anything like it, she says, and the man hasn't either. Neither knows what species it is, and, strangely, there don't seem to be any others like it. Maybe this is the result of an odd genetic defect that turns blue spruces red. After admiring the tree for a moment, the pair decides that they've hiked far enough and that they should probably head back to the car. She jokes that he's likely exhausted from his run-in with a wild animal and he laughs, but clearly his ego has been bruised. The man stops his car in front of the woman's house and she thanks him for taking her on the hike. As she starts to get out though, he stops her. He asks if she wants to go do something else, like dinner? The woman thanks him for his offer, but she has to be up early the next day for work. Just a quick drink then? An hour? Thirty minutes? The woman tries her best to let her friend down easy, explaining that she likes him as a friend and as only that. The man opens his mouth to respond, but she stops him. If he valued their friendship, then he wouldn't try to take advantage of it by using it as a backdoor to dating her. The man again looks like his pride has been shattered. He apologizes and admits that she is right. It's just that he has such a good time with her that he never wants it to end. She gives him a sad smile as she closes the car door, and he watches her enter her house before he finally drives away. It's two weeks later when the man's phone rings. It's his friend. She explains that she's been thinking a lot about what he said in the car and that she likes spending time with him too. Maybe there could be something more to their relationship. The man can't believe it. Is this really happening? The woman is serious. She'd like to take him up on that dinner offer, if he's still interested. Her treat. She wants to know what he is doing right- Ah! The man suddenly yelps in pain. Is he okay? What was that sound? Yes, I'm fine, it was nothing, the man tells her. It's just that now… now's not a good time. The woman doesn't understand. She thought he'd want to see her. She explains that she's leaving town for a work trip the next day and will be gone for a couple of weeks. She was hoping she could see him before she left, but… The man cries out in pain again. He tells her that he hasn't been feeling well all day, but that he'll be alright. Okay, well, get well soon. I'll call you when I get back." They exchange goodbyes, and the man hangs up the phone. The man looks terrible. His skin is pale, and his face looks hollow and gaunt. He looks down at his arm and sees that the veins themselves appear to be moving, pulsing, and vibrating. 
He screams again in agony and falls to the floor, clutching his arm. After writhing on the floor, he manages to summon the strength to reach for the phone. His hand searches on the table above him, and eventually he's able to knock it onto the floor. He grabs the phone and starts to dial. Nine, one, before he can press one again, another wave of intense searing pain consumes him. Several weeks later, the woman is standing outside the man's house. Mail and newspapers are piled up on his front porch, as if no one has been in or out in some time. She knocks on the door, but there's no response. Hello? She calls out, but still nothing. She's very worried. She's tried calling him several times, but he never answered or returned her messages. She tries the doorknob, and to her surprise, the front door swings open. She steps inside and the room is dark. She's also immediately hit by a strong aroma of… pine? She searches on the wall and finds the switch. She turns on the lights and can't believe what she sees standing in front of her. There in the middle of the room is a massive spruce tree, its upper branches pressing against the ceiling. She reaches out and touches the tree's vivid red branches. They feel sticky and wet. She pulls her hand away and looks down to see that it's covered in a red substance. That's when she notices something else. Stuck among the trunk at the base of the tree is the half-consumed body of her friend. Unfortunately, this pair would never have the opportunity to see their feelings take root and grow, because unbeknownst to them, this beautiful tree is actually a very deadly anomaly, known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-867, but which is perhaps better known by its very appropriate nickname, Blood Spruce. SCP-867 is, or at least appears to be, quite similar to the species of tree Piscea pungens, better known as the blue spruce. Of course, there are a number of dramatic differences between 867 and its non-anomalous counterpart. Visually, and most obvious, is the coloration. While blue spruces, as the name implies, are typically a blue-green color, SCP-867 is a deep, vibrant red. There's another major visual difference too, with the blood spruce lacking any sort of seed cones that you would normally expect to find. With no pine cones to protect and spread seeds, you'd be right to ask how SCP-867 goes about reproducing. The answer to that question is what makes this beautiful tree such a dangerous anomaly. The secret to how SCP-867 reproduces is found in its leaves. While they look like pine needles, SCP-867's leaves are, in fact, needles. Their structure is very similar to that of hypodermic needles and each one contains a single long thin seed which sits above a small gas pocket at the base. When a living creature touches the leaves, the tree immediately reacts. It triggers the gas pocket in the base of the leaf to release, which injects the seed into the skin of whatever touched it. The process is quite similar to that found in auto-injectors, like those used to quickly treat allergic reactions. The seed itself is extremely small and is coated in a liquid that has both anesthetic and coagulant properties, which makes the process virtually undetectable. Once implanted in the skin, these seeds can lay dormant for up to two weeks before they begin the germination process and the true horror of SCP-867 is revealed. Once the seeds begin to sprout and grow, they will not seek to penetrate through the skin like a plant rising out of the soil. Instead, the strange plant will grow within its host's body, spreading throughout the circulatory system. This process is extremely painful for the host. The plant's tendrils wind through their veins and capillary system, stretching and pressing against them as the blood spruce grows within them. Eventually, the ever-increasing size of the plant's tendrils becomes too much and the veins will begin to rupture. This leads to severe internal bleeding and soon after, the death of the host. The entire process is quite quick with it only taking 24 hours from when the seeds first sprout to the host dying. But that single day will feel like an eternity to the afflicted individual as they feel the plant rapidly growing inside of their body. But even though the host has expired, this parasitoid tree is far from finished with them, or at least their body. Soon after death, a new instance of the blood spruce will burst from the body. The red tree is quite small at first, but it will continue to quickly grow, just as it did within its host's body, and can reach maturity in just 30 days. And unlike most other plants, SCP-867 is able to grow regardless of light or soil conditions, because it does not produce food via photosynthesis. No, this plant is carnivorous. As it grows, the 867 will slowly consume its host's body until nothing remains except the blood-red tree. 
Instances of SCP-867 were first identified in Colorado during the 1990s, following reports of numerous disappearances of hikers and park rangers. The SCP Foundation dispatched a team to the area to investigate, and they soon discovered numerous instances of the previously unidentified tree. Several still young specimens were acquired, though unfortunately, this led to the deaths of several agents, who were not yet aware of just how dangerous the red spruces could be. Once their threat level was properly assessed, several specimens were flagged for containment and research purposes, while all of the other identified instances still in the wild were destroyed. The remaining instances of SCP-867 were classified as Euclid and are now securely kept at a Foundation biocontainment site. Direct human contact with the plants is normally not allowed, and remote rovers are used for the majority of tests and upkeep. If for any reason it is necessary for a human to enter 867's containment cell, they are to wear full hazmat suits with a Kevlar underlayer, and upon exiting the cell, must undergo a full herbicidal treatment and inspection. Should any possible puncture marks be discovered, they will be forced to quarantine for no less than 15 days. Ah, nature. It's so beautiful, peaceful, and calming, yet seems determined to try and kill us in any number of ways. If you're out hiking or camping in the woods, try to remember this extremely famous adage which I may or may not have just made up. It goes, leaves of three, let them be. Needles of red, well, you're probably already dead. Candace Hayes, we have thy confession. A witch as brazen as you shall be burned at the stake. The crowd gathered in the small room bursts into a cheer as the judge hands down the sentence. The accused woman doesn't react, though. She looks neither scared nor afraid, but simply resigned to her fate. No time is to be wasted in carrying out the punishment that the judge has decreed. A pair of constables grab the woman by the arms and take her away. A mob follows along as the woman is led through the town, taunting and jeering, calling her a witch, a wife of Satan, and worse names. She doesn't seem affected by them, though. In fact, she looks as if she can't even see them. Her attention is focused solely on one mysterious woman who walks along with the crowd, and yet somehow seems disconnected, as if she isn't truly there either. The two women maintain eye contact as the constables keep pushing the condemned woman along. They lead the woman outside of town to a tall hill. The ropes binding the woman's hands are cut and she has just a moment to rub her sore wrists before she is forced to the ground and lashed to a piece of wood as another group tosses the last logs onto a nearby pile. Once she is securely tied down, the constables step away, but then another man wearing a hood approaches. He carries a large club and without hesitation begins beating her legs. The woman's composure finally breaks, and she cries in pain from the cracking of her bones. The crowd only cheers louder at the screams from the witch. The beating has left the woman's legs mangled, but this is far from over. The woman, still strapped to the wood, is placed on the pyre, where she hangs like a scarecrow above the combustible material. The judge steps forward out of the screaming mob, carrying a torch. He loudly exclaims that for her crimes, she will be burned until dead. But the judge doesn't step forward. He instead announces that another will have the honor of lighting the flame. Another man steps out of the crowd and takes the torch from the judge. He walks towards the pyre and looks up at the woman. She is exhausted from the beating, but she lifts her head. She doesn't look at the man with the torch, though. She's looking past him, locking eyes with the mysterious woman who walked along with the crowd. The man looks angry, slighted that she won't even meet his eyes in this final moment. And without another moment's hesitation, he tosses the torch onto the pyre. The wood lights instantly, the tinder combusting and turning into a huge roaring fire. The crowd also erupts into even louder cries of celebration as the woman screams from inside the blaze. The man watches as the woman is lost behind the fire and the smoke, and eventually her cries too are hidden behind the crackles and pops of the flames. He doesn't move until the fire has nearly burned itself out. Most of the crowd has left at this point, having gone back to their homes, content with the role they played in doing the Lord's work. As the constables pull a charred torso down from the wood and unceremoniously toss it over a steep side of the hill, the man finally turns and starts to walk away, a tear rolling down his cheek. The judge approaches and places a hand on the man's shoulder. There, there, the judge says, attempting to comfort the man. You'll find a new wife soon enough. 
Hundreds of people were accused of witchcraft in colonial America, and while it is likely that many were falsely accused, there is reason to believe that some were under the influence of, or were themselves, what we now describe as anomalies. And SCP-3998 is just such an example, better known as the Wicker Witch Lives. SCP-3998 is a human cadaver which dates from the late 17th century that is covered in fourth-degree burns and is missing its legs. There is also evidence of extensive blunt force trauma, but it is not known if the beating or the burning was the ultimate cause of death. At some point, the remains were collected and fastened into a scarecrow that is held together with wicker, nails, and wire. While a scarecrow fashioned from a cadaver is rather unconventional, what brought SCP-3998 to the SCP Foundation's attention were its other anomalous attributes. It constantly secretes a flammable liquid from its bones that primarily consists of ethanol and human fat, and every night between 11 p.m. and 4 a.m., the corpse ignites. This fire doesn't cause any damage to the corpse, though, and it is unknown how it produces the flammable liquid or ignites. 3998 does not keep its flames to itself, though. It appears that the SCP targets those who have either killed or physically abused a romantic partner, causing them to catch fire as large quantities of boiling ethanol appear in their stomach. Their midsection will eventually melt and then explode, leading to amputation of the lower half of their body. The fire burns both incredibly hot and unnaturally fast, and is unable to be put out until SCP-3998 is extinguished. A number of historical documents related to the case have been discovered and made available to Foundation researchers that shed light on SCP-3998, including excerpts from a 17th century diary belonging to a woman who lived near where the cadaver was discovered. In the entries, the woman describes attending the wedding of her neighbors, Aidan and Candace Hayes, though Candace did not seem especially happy with the arrangement. Candace is characterized as someone who likes to keep to herself and who does not conform to the era's idea of a good wife. As a result, it appears that she became the victim of abuse at the hand of her husband. The diarist hypothesizes that Candace has brought this fate upon herself due to her behavior, which may stem from her being under the hold of the devil. In other words, the neighbor believes that Candace is a witch. Others must have had the same suspicion, because we also have records of Candace's interview with a Judge William Stoughton, who questioned her about the accusations of consorting with evil spirits. Candace readily admitted to this, though she disagreed that it was in any way evil. She told the judge that the rituals and magics she practiced were not inherently good or bad, and that anyone was capable of using the same tools. She went on to explain that she hated her husband, that she had been forced to marry him, and that he had been nothing but cruel and violent towards her. Candace also mentioned a name, Clovis, that the judge assumed to be the demon that she had made her cursed pact with. Candace appeared to offer no defense or excuses for her actions, and the judge sentenced her to die by burning at the stake, with her husband, Aiden, being the one to light the fire. The story of this witch trial was typical of the time, and that likely would have been the end of what we know about SCP-3998. But another historical document was located that has truly given a new perspective to this anomaly. A sealed letter found in the cellar of a home that is addressed to Candace, though it appears to have been written after her death. The letter is from her secret lover, and describes how they collected Candace's burnt bones from the bottom of the hill before binding them together with wicker and wire. The letter then describes how Candace's husband has recently restocked his own home with gin, which is well known to be extremely flammable. The letter ends with an affirmation of the writer's eternal love for Candace and is signed, Clovis. But perhaps the best information we have about the origin of SCP-3998 comes from an obscure local tale that was passed down orally for years and eventually documented on an urban legend website. The legend tells of a woman who promised her soul to a she-devil who taught her magic but also offered companionship. When her husband found out, he contacted the local authorities and had the woman arrested. She was tried, her legs were broken, and she was hung up like a scarecrow before being burned alive. Her body was dumped off the side of a mountain, but the she-devil collected her bones and gave her life again. The need for revenge burned in the woman's heart, so in the middle of the night, she doused herself in her husband's gin, set herself on fire once more, and fell upon him as he slept, burning him alive so he could suffer the way that she did. 
SCP-3998 is currently held in a secure holding locker in Site-34 that is fireproofed and vacuum sealed to prevent it from igniting. Every morning at 9 a.m., 3998 and its locker are cleaned to remove the secretions of flammable liquid. D-Class personnel who have been convicted of domestic abuse crimes are to always be kept at the site to ensure that they are the targets of SCP-3998, which when it's not allowed to ignite, will result in them only feeling mild discomfort in their head and chest rather than spontaneous combustion. Due to its relatively easy method of containment, SCP-3998 has been classified as safe. However, recent developments have caused the Foundation to rethink this classification. Despite 3998 being securely contained, the number of arson-related homicides in the state of Massachusetts have actually increased following containment, with many showing the same damage to their body as would be expected in a victim of SCP-3998. And while it may be that these are the result of a yet uncaught serial killer who simply happens to employ similar methods of killing their victims, a recent re-examination of the SCP-3998 corpse has revealed more troubling details. The body of SCP-3998 does not belong to Candace Hayes, and in fact appears to be a male who was in his 30s at the time of his death. Following these new revelations, reclassification of SCP-3998 to Euclid is pending. Whether SCP-3998 is the body of Candace's husband Aiden, forced to endure an eternal punishment of burning again each and every night, or if it's some other unfortunate victim of a violent and painful death, is unknown as is the ultimate fate of Candace and Clovis. But with the deaths that would appear to be attributable to SCP-3998 showing no signs of stopping despite containment, it can only be assumed that the Wicker Witch lives. You're on your way home from work after having just finished working a double shift. It's late, and the interstate is completely abandoned, no cars visible either in front or behind you. It's only about a 20-minute drive, but you know you're going to struggle to stay awake, even in this old beater that shakes and rattles as it travels down the long, straight road. The rattling causes a piece of tape to fall off of the gauge cluster, revealing a lit, check engine light beneath. You grab the tape and put it back over the light, covering it once again. There, good as new. You turn on the radio, and it comes to life for just a moment before dying. You slap the radio and it blinks to life for just a second before dying again. You're about to slap it again when you notice huh? lights in your rearview mirror. And more than just a pair of headlights, it's a whole wall of lights. They're getting closer, and quickly too. Before you know it, they look like they're barreling down on you. But then they suddenly go black, blinking out of existence. Did that trucker just turn off his lights, you think? You have no time to dwell on the thought because the sound of an explosion suddenly causes you to scream in fright. It sounds like lightning has struck just inches from your car. The inside of your car suddenly lights up with fire and smoke. Has your engine exploded? What's going on? No, it's not coming from you, it's coming from next to you. You don't know where it appeared from, but next to your car is now a massive semi. At least, you think it was a semi. The smoke is so thick it makes you cough and you quickly can't see. You lose control of the car and slam on the brakes, but you can feel yourself going off the road. As the smoke finally clears up inside of your car, you can see the moon. It's at this moment that you realize you're no longer right side up as the car flips and tumbles through the air. You open your eyes to find that you're still buckled into your seat. You release the seatbelt and drop to the roof of the car. You crawl out to find that your car slid to a stop upside down several meters from the road. You look around and far off in the distance, you can see it. The semi that ran you off the road, driving at an almost impossible rate of speed off into the night. You look back at your car, which is completely totaled, and wonder what you're going to do now. It's late the next morning when you finally get back home. The police did not seem to believe your story about the magically appearing semi-truck causing your single car accident, but they did at least give you a ride back home after administering a sobriety test. You enter your small studio apartment and look around at the sparsely decorated room, wondering how you're going to pay rent next month if you can't get to your job. You go to the fridge and open the door, but there's nothing inside except for a carton of milk that's well past its expiration date. You open it and take a whiff, but this is too far gone even for your state of desperation. You close the fridge and lean on the door, trying to figure out what you're going to do. You're so deep in thought that you barely notice the mail being pushed through the slot in your door. You decide to go pick it up, even though you know it will only be bad news. And you were right. Bills, bills, and more bills. 
first, second, and final notices. You wonder if you've ever had a piece of good news show up through that slot in your door. What's this, though? The last piece of mail is a battered and folded envelope that looks like it's been used and repurposed many times. It feels thick and heavy, but there's no information on it at all. It's completely blank. You open the envelope, and your eyes light up. Inside is money. It's a stack of crinkled old bills, different denominations, all in a random order, but there's a lot of them. There must be over a thousand dollars here. And there's something else, too. A note. You unfold the creased and dirty piece of paper to see a simple message that looks like it was hastily written in black crayon. All the note says is, Sorry about last night. Hope this helps, compadre. You flip the note over and look in the envelope again, but there's nothing else other than the wad of cash. The apology note may have been unsigned, but you weren't the first to receive something like it, and you would be far from the last. The SCP Foundation, though, knows exactly who sent it. This was a message from SCP-3899, also known as the Night Hauler. SCP-3899 is a black Peterbilt 379 semi-trailer truck with an attached trailer, but as you no doubt have determined, this is no ordinary truck. SCP-3899 has the anomalous effect of appearing seemingly at random upon stretches of highway within the continental United States and usually at a considerable distance away from any other motorists. The truck will manifest already in motion, traveling within roughly 3 kilometers per hour of the posted speed limit, but it will not stay at this speed. Once SCP-3899 has appeared, it will almost immediately begin accelerating, and the speeds it can reach are truly staggering. Despite appearing to be a normal truck, SCP-3899 is able to reach impossibly fast speeds, and it's been observed traveling at over 420 kilometers per hour, or 267 miles per hour. As SCP-3899 flies down the road, it will attempt to avoid other vehicles and roadside objects, and has even been shown the ability to displace itself across short distances, which it seems to mostly do in order to avoid collisions with vehicles. SCP-3899 will disappear and then immediately appear somewhere else, though always within 300 meters of its last location. This reappearance will be accompanied by a thick cloud of dense, black smoke that lab tests have revealed to consist of a mixture of diesel fuel combustion byproducts, volcanic ash, and trace amounts of unidentified human blood. The anomalous truck will only appear at night and will demanifest completely once it encounters direct sunlight or if it causes an automotive accident which it has done plenty of times. In one particular incident, undercover SCP Foundation agents working within the Virginia State Department of Transportation became aware of reports of a large black truck appearing on a particular stretch of interstate that had caused multiple accidents. They were able to track down and locate one of the victims of these incidents, a woman named Martha Lewis, who they soon brought in for questioning under the guise of it being a police investigation. The agents questioned Martha on her experience, and she explained her own interaction with the black semi. She said, It's all still clear in my head. I'm driving down I-64 on my way home and the sun had just gone down. There's no other cars and I'm about to take my exit when out of nowhere this huge truck just appears right next to me. There's a bunch of smoke, like it was on fire or something, and the sound was like a bolt of lightning had just struck right next to me. It all happened so fast. All the smoke clouded my windshield and before I could really process what was happening, I was plowing right through a concrete divider and into some trees. I think I passed out. When I came to, there were paramedics and cops. They took me to the hospital. The agents asked if anything happened after that, and she said there was one other odd thing. When she left the hospital and went home, there was a letter waiting for her, but it didn't have a return address. Inside was a large amount of US currency in a random assortment of denominations, with many of the bills appearing wrinkled and worn. There was a note in the envelope too, which read, I'm sorry, didn't mean no harm, for the damages, get y'all a new rig and drive on. Later foundation analysis of the document revealed that the note was written with a piece of charcoal on non-anomalous notebook paper. Now you're probably asking yourself the same question that the SCP researchers had. Just who is the driver of SCP-3899 that apparently wrote this odd note and also paid for the damages they caused? The operator of the truck, which has been designated as SCP-3899-1, is a very mysterious figure. Observers who have been able to get a brief glimpse inside of the truck as it moves past them at a rapid speed have described the driver as looking only like a silhouette of a slightly overweight male wearing the type of headwear that is typically referred to as a trucker hat. 
Some reports have also alluded to the presence of what appears to be smoky, tentacle-like appendages within the cap. Though all further efforts to determine the exact physical characteristics of 3899-1 have failed, as the truck has proved resistant to any kind of outside scanning equipment. Most of what is known about the driver has come in the form of direct communication, though not in the form of interviews or any other sort of face-to-face -face interaction. No, while SCP-3899-1 has never been willing to stop and have a discussion with Foundation agents, it does seem more than willing to speak with anyone and everyone in its immediate vicinity over Citizens Band, or CB Radio, which is a type of shortwave person-to-person -person communication system that is popular with many long-haul truckers. In one particular instance, an SCP Foundation helicopter happened to be traveling above a stretch of road where SCP-3899 appeared. An agent within the helicopter began communicating with the anomalous trucker, first asking for their call sign, to which SCP-3899-1 replied, I'm a night hauler and I'm coming in hot. I know y'all can feel this speed. After adjusting their volume to compensate for 3899-1's loud response, the agent asked if the entity could explain where they came from. 3899-1 answered with, I roll with the wind. My wheels sing sweet love to the blacktop. I'm filling y'all's veins with road salt and exhaust and the smell of burning rubber. Ain't no bother where I'm from. We all gotta live for the ride and die for nothing. I see, the agent responded before asking, Are you hauling anything in particular? SCP-3899-1 came back with, Ain't you listening, girl? You seeing this? What I got is pure rattling salvation. 18 wheels at a time. When y'all's roads is choked, when the ways is blocked and y'all's speed is all dead and gone. I'm dropping this load and we'll all be drinking gas and breathing smoke. The agent didn't understand, though, and asked again who they were and what they wanted. 3899-1 replied, This is for the souls of the road, for the long nights and dead engines, and everyone trying to put that horizon under their wheels. I am the roar of hot iron. I am screaming freedom. I am the death of all barriers. This rig ain't got no quit, honey. I do not stop. Can you feel the rumble? Can you see the fire and smell the burn? I know you can. I can taste your heart and I know you want to fly apart with me. When the agent began to answer in the affirmative that they could indeed, quote, feel the rumble, seemingly caught up in the excitement of SCP-3899-1's proclamation, the investigation was quickly halted and the helicopter broke off from its pursuit. Following this incident, the potential mimetic influence of communicating with 3899-1 is under investigation. SCP-3899, being currently uncontainable by any conventional means, has been classified as Keter. Upon reports of it manifesting, all CB radio transmissions emanating from the truck are monitored by nearby Foundation listening posts for attempted contact by SCP-3899 to civilian recipients. Any individuals who are contacted are to be administered Class B amnestics, as are any eyewitnesses of the truck itself. All information about SCP-3899 is to be suppressed, and a disinformation campaign is active to make all reports of a mysterious truck that can appear out of nowhere and move at impossible speeds seem like nothing more than an urban legend. Just what is SCP-3899? Is the driver some sort of anomalous ghost, or perhaps an old, eldritch god, a manifestation of freedom and perpetual motion given physical form as a diesel-powered behemoth on the highway? Perhaps the answer to that question is up to you. An SCP Foundation doctor wearing a hazmat suit is escorted by two guards through the secure facility. They stop in front of a large, sealed door, and one of the guards scans his security card. There's an audible hiss as the door slides open. The doctor nervously looks to the guard who motions him inside. They certainly won't be joining him. The doctor steps into the small airlock, and the door snaps shut. A complicated locking mechanism seals the door behind him. He's truly locked in. The reverse process then begins on the locked door in front of him. It finishes, and the door opens, revealing a room with bright lights that briefly blind the doctor. As his eyes adjust, he can see that the entire room is white and bathed in an intense light. He steps out of the airlock and towards the center of the room where his task awaits. He takes one slow step at a time, pausing for a moment after each before taking the next. The doctor wants to get this over with as quickly as possible, but he has to abide by the protocols, and this is how they dictate that one must walk in this containment chamber. As the doctor gets closer to the center, and his eyes further adjust to the bright light, he can finally see what this room contains. In the very middle of the room, directly under the lights, is a man. 
He's lying on a table and isn't moving at all, except for his slow, rhythmic breathing, which is assisted by the ventilator he's connected to. A feeding tube has been placed inside his nose, and numerous machines next to the man hum and beep as they measure his vital signs. The doctor continues to take one slow step after another, and eventually, after what feels like an eternity, he reaches the middle of the room. The lights above the man are angled to create large, dark shadows coming off of him, and now the doctor is finally close enough to make out what he was warned about in his briefings. Even though the man is completely still, the shadows are moving. Scurrying on the edges of the man's shadow are what look to be spiders, and big ones too, roughly three inches across. But the doctor can't see any actual spiders on the man. Only the shadows of these massive arachnids are visible as they move back and forth along the man's shadow. The doctor is growing increasingly nervous. He can feel the sweat dripping down the inside of his hazmat suit, though he tries to tell himself it's just a result of the bright lights beating down on him. The doctor reaches the machines measuring the man's vital signs and jots down their readings, marking down that the man's medically induced coma appears stable. He's continually distracted from his work, though, by the movement of the spiders. One suddenly jumps from one part of the man's shadow to another, startling the doctor and causing him to jump back. The spiders abruptly stop moving, and even though he can't see their eyes, he has the feeling that they are looking right at him. The doctor is frozen with fear, staring right back at the spiders. But after a moment, they go back to their previous behavior and start crawling along the edge of the comatose man's shadows once more. The doctor continues to go down his checklist and audibly gulps. He's reached the final item, the one labeled physical exam. Nervous sweat runs down his face into his eyes, and he wishes he wasn't wearing this hazmat suit so he could wipe it off. He knows he must get much closer to the man, and more importantly, his shadow, than he feels comfortable with. He has to physically take the man's pulse, though. They won't let him out of this room if he doesn't. He reaches out towards the man's hand, slowly and carefully. He can see the shadow of his hand getting dangerously close to the man's shadow, and the spiders. One of the spiders stops moving, as if it is watching and waiting for the doctor's shadow to get closer. It raises up on its hind legs, looking like it is ready to pounce. The doctor gets closer and closer to the man's hand, when out of nowhere, the room is rocked by an explosion. The doctor spins around, and on a monitor next to the airlock door, he can see a feed of the hallway outside. The guards who had escorted him run down the hall as a red emergency light flashes. He turns back to the man on the table. The spider that was waiting for him lowers itself out of its attack mode and goes back to scurrying along the shadow. The room is shaken by an even bigger explosion, and it suddenly goes dark. The power must have gone out from whatever is happening outside. He can hear the sound of muffled gunfire mixed with far-off screams, but both are drowned out by his nervous, heavy breathing inside of the suit. The doctor drops to the ground and tries to crawl back to the door, but he has no idea which direction it is. He hits his head hard and hears a crack come down his mask. That must have been the table. The doctor turns and crawls the other direction, eventually finding the airlock door. He stands up and bangs and pulls on the door, but it won't move. He fumbles with his hazmat suit and finds the button for his emergency light. A chemical light comes on inside of his suit, casting his face in a sickly yellow light. But the light starts to flicker. Something must be malfunctioning. The light on one side of his protective mask goes out, leaving half of his face in darkness. But that's the least of his problems, because all of his attention is now focused on the shadow moving across his face. It's the shadow of a spider. His eyes go wide as the spider stops and stands up on its rear legs. Arachnophobia, the fear of spiders, and sciophobia, the fear of shadows, are some of the most common phobias, and today's SCP file is a terrifying and dangerous combination of both. I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-538, also known as the Shadow Spiders. SCP-538 is what appears to be a kind of living shadow, not dissimilar to SCP-017, though these shadows always take the form of an unknown species of spider. These anomalous arachnids seek out the shadows cast by other living objects, attaching themselves to the edge of the living creature's shadow in such a way that their own shadows aren't obscured. Once attached to a shadow, the spiders will appear to feed off of them. 
This allows them to rapidly grow in size, with adults measuring a total area of roughly 15 square centimeters. Once they reach their full size, they will continue to feed, though this will only maintain their size. The feeding process seems to not impact the host in any way, and the spiders can remain on a shadow indefinitely. While the spiders have been observed feeding on the shadows of inanimate objects when no living creatures are available, these don't appear to provide the spiders with whatever nutrients they require, and they will slowly atrophy and decrease in size. It is only when they are connected to the shadow of a living organism that SCP-538 can thrive. SCP-538 are not locked to the shadow they are on, though. The spiders have shown the ability to move across areas to reach a new host, though they will decrease in size when not attached to a shadow, losing as much as two square centimeters of their size for every second that they aren't on a shadow. And should they be stranded in the open without a shadow to feed on, they will decrease in size until they disappear completely, at which point that individual instance of SCP-538 is considered to be terminated. The spiders normally avoid this fate thanks to their extremely fast movement, though and fully grown instances have been measured moving up to 1 meter per second. While SCP-538 instances are usually quite benign, seeming content to simply live on the shadow of their host, they will attack if they are frightened, which is when the real danger presented by these anomalous arachnids comes to light. If the spiders are agitated, usually from the result of a rapid movement by its host, the spider will bite the organism's shadow before attempting to flee. Once bitten, the unlucky individual will progress through five distinct stages, all of which take place over the course of roughly one hour. During the first, the subject will report pain in the area of their body that corresponds to the part of their shadow that was bitten, but no puncture wounds or other marks will be visible in this location. Minor psychological effects have been reported in this stage, mostly consisting of an increase in irritability and the tendency for the bitten subject to lash out at those around them. The second stage occurs 10 to 15 minutes after being bitten. The subject will begin sweating, despite reporting that they feel cold, while their skin will become red and warm to the touch. 25 to 30 minutes after the bite, the third stage will begin. At this point, the psychological effects become very noticeable, with the subject becoming violent and attempting to attack any person nearby. Their speech will be slurred, and they may show signs of impairment to their motor skills. The fourth stage begins at the 40 to 45 minute mark, and at this point, the subject's skin color will go from being red to a pale white as their core temperature drops 5 to 8 degrees Celsius. Their psychological state will alter once again, and they will go from being extremely aggressive to overly apologetic, blaming their previous behavior on the fact that they weren't feeling well and weren't acting like themselves. After offering their apologies, they will then request their leave from the area and attempt to retreat to a darkened area. The fifth and final stage happens 55 to 60 minutes after the bite, at which point the subject faces a grisly end to the entire ordeal. Their entire body will rapidly dissolve into a translucent liquid, while at the exact same time, their shadow will disintegrate into numerous smaller instances of SCP-538. The spider offspring measure just 4 centimeters across, and the new instances will immediately begin seeking out shadows of their own that they can attach to and feed off of. There is currently no known cure for being bitten by an SCP-538 instance, and even death will not halt the process. Instead, should the subject expire while in the earlier stages of the condition, death will cause the final step to occur immediately. In a bit of good news, only bites to the area of an individual's shadow that correspond to a spot of bare skin seem to cause these effects. Even thin materials like cotton clothing appear to be enough to prevent the process from starting. The SCP Foundation has multiple instances of SCP-538 in containment, and they are kept in a white 15 by 15 by 3 meter room that is accessible only via an airlock. Four 200 watt lights are focused on a table in the center of the room, where D-Class personnel in a medically induced coma is kept in a stable state, in order to serve as a feeding source for the SCP-538 specimens. No other sources of shade are allowed into the room, so that the D-Class serves as the only source of shadows. Any personnel that enter the room, whether to repair a light source or to check on the condition of the D-Class, are to wear sealed hazardous material suits equipped with oxygen tanks, and are advised that they must move slowly and deliberately in order to avoid agitating any instances of SCP-538. Initially, doctors sent to examine the D-Class personnel were allowed to enter the room alone. However, 
Following the events of Incident I-538-1, that protocol has been changed. During the incident, an attack by the Chaos Insurgency caused disruptions to both the main and backup power sources to the part of the site where the SCP-538 containment cell is located, just as a Foundation doctor was in the middle of an examination of the comatose D-Class. Power outage led to all lights in the containment cell shutting off, while at the same time sealing the airlock that provides the only means in or out of the room and trapping the doctor inside. The power was not able to be restored to the containment cell for another 18 hours, at which point the doctor was finally removed from the cell. The doctor sobbed uncontrollably as he kept repeating that he could feel them crawling all over him. The doctor was required to attend mandatory psychological therapy for his newly developed arachnophobia and was later reassigned. Following this incident, the examination protocol was updated and health checkups of the D-Class personnel are now performed by a doctor who is accompanied in the cell by two security personnel, each of whom are equipped with two 250-watt flashlights that can be used in the event of another disruption to the lights. If at any time a staff member is bitten by one of the spiders, they are to be immediately placed within SCP-538's containment cell as soon as possible, as the failure to properly contain them could easily lead to a massive containment breach by SCP-538 entities. Bitten individuals will often attempt to hide the fact that they are bitten, so anyone who comes into contact with the shadow spiders must be carefully monitored for signs of any of the symptoms that follow a bite. The ease with which they could quickly spread and the huge threat they pose to humanity has led to SCP-538 being classified as Euclid, and while the Foundation hopes that they have been successfully contained, we all must remain ever vigilant of movement on the edge of shadows. Should you spot something, don't take any chances. Your future, non-liquefied body will thank you for it. A pair of urban explorers are standing in front of a rather creepy-looking public school building. One explains to the other that it has been abandoned for years, though no one in the town seems to know exactly why. The two pull a board off one of the windows and climb through. The inside looks pretty much like they were expecting. Their flashlights reveal that years of squatters, teens partying, and wild animals have left plenty of refuse and debris lying around. There are two wings branching off the central portion of the building. They pick one of them to explore and start walking down the hall. As they make their way down past the graffiti-tagged walls, they stop to investigate one of the classrooms. It looks to be in the same bad state as the rest of the building, but incredibly, they're still writing on the chalkboard, as if the teacher stopped in the middle of a lesson and walked out. There's even a shriveled old apple still on the desk. As they exit the classroom back into the hallway, one of them stops. Wasn't the graffiti on the wall different before? Impossible, they must be mistaken. They keep walking and come to a stairwell. Time to explore the upper floors. They head up the stairs to the second floor and poke their head out. Everything looks to be about the same as on the first floor. They go back into the stairwell and start heading up again. It feels like they've been walking up the stairs for a long time though. They should be all the way at the roof by now. They finally reach a door. It must lead to a taller part of the building they couldn't see from the ground outside. They open the door and see… the second floor again. How could this be? The two look at each other. They have explored a lot of strange abandoned places, but nothing has creeped them out like this before. They head back down the stairs, and after only a few steps, they are back on the first floor. Something is really wrong with this place. Maybe it's best if they leave. They start walking back towards the entrance, but one grabs the other and points into a classroom. Isn't this the room they went in before? It has to be. The same apple is on the desk, but the complicated physics lesson has been erased. Now the chalkboard has just a simple phrase written on it. The children used to sing. The two scream and run out of the classroom, but which way is the entrance? The hall appears to stretch on in either direction before turning at 90 degree angles. This isn't right. The entrance was definitely visible from outside the classroom before. They pick a direction and start to run. The hallways seem to go on and on, turning in ways that should double back on themselves, but they still can't find the entrance. They try going back up through a stairwell, but just like before, there appears to be either too many or not enough stairs between the floors. The explorers keep running, checking rooms for a way out. Somehow they keep finding that same room with the rotten apple on the desk. They're panicking now. Every time they look away, the graffiti on the wall changes, or a new classroom door appears in the hall. They keep running though, turning corner after corner after corner until… there it is, the entrance. 
But it's then that one of the explorers realizes he is all alone. He must have outran his friend. He looks at the entrance. It's so close. He starts to step towards it, but no. He can't leave his friend. He'll find him. He turns around and right in front of him is the same classroom again. The one with the apple. Only this time, his friend is in there, sitting in a desk in the middle of the room, asleep. Gathering the last of his courage, he runs into the room and tries to wake his friend, but he won't come out of his deep sleep. He pulls him out of the desk. If he won't walk out, he'll drag him out. He pulls him out of the classroom and down the hall towards the entrance. They're almost home free. He's just feet away from the door. He reaches out with his free hand and grabs the handle. Locked. He starts banging on the door, terrified that they'll be trapped in this place forever. When suddenly, the doors swing open. Two stern-looking men in suits are standing in front of him. You aren't supposed to be here, one of the men says, as the other picks up his friend, throws him over his shoulder, and escorts the both of them out of the school. What these urban explorers didn't know is that they had just unintentionally entered a mysterious anomaly that the SCP Foundation has designated SCP-026, a strange location that has been given the nickname After School Retention. SCP-026 is a three-story building that used to be a public school prior to it being shut down and condemned after both staff and students reported various anomalous properties in the building. They described hallways that seemed to change in length, classrooms disappearing and reappearing, and stairways with different numbers of steps leading up and down. The discrepancies between the building's blueprints and the reported interior were strange enough, but the former school truly came onto the Foundation's radar after the disappearances of multiple people in the area were linked to the location. It was initially believed, after sending in robots equipped with video equipment to explore the school, that the spatial anomalies were actually caused by an anomalous mental effect the space was having on people's perception, and that the physical layout of the school was not actually changing. However, additional exploration has proven that this is not the case. The physical space of the school does in fact seem to change, and even the exploration robots are affected by this shifting geometry. The inside of the school is covered in a substantial amount of graffiti, and most of it is the type you'd expect to see in any abandoned space. Gang signs, names, and street art, for example. But it appears to fade in and out and will change location. The writing on the chalkboards in the classroom appears to do the same, and just like the graffiti, much of what is written on the chalkboards is what you would expect to find in a school. Most of the writing relates to basic subjects like math, literature, and biology. However, some of the subjects that have appeared are highly advanced and out of place in a non-university setting, such as the notes on quantum entanglement that were found on a chalkboard. Bizarrely, the phrase, the children used to sing, has been found multiple times in a variety of places around the building though researchers are still left without an answer as to what it means or what significance it holds. But the anomalous nature of the writing inside of SCP-026 doesn't stop there. The written content of books, notepads, and other pieces of paper brought into the school have been observed to disappear, leaving blank pages behind, only for the writing to reappear as graffiti or on the chalkboards. It is unknown why or how this is happening. But those working within SCP-026 are advised to be careful of what written materials they bring inside. Multiple unconscious persons have also been found in the building. Several of the people found in the school have been identified as either former students or faculty of the school, including teachers and janitors, all of whom had been reported missing in the years following the school's closure. Despite some of them disappearing as long as 10 years after the school closed, when they are found inside SCP-026, they appear much younger than they should be, with the majority being high school aged and dressed in the style of the school's dress code in the time before it was shut down. It is currently not known how they ended up inside of SCP-026 or why they present as being a younger version of themselves. Attempts to wake unconscious people while still inside the school are always unsuccessful. However, once they are transported outside of SCP-026, they will immediately awaken. All have displayed signs of confusion in their brief moments of consciousness, before quickly dying from what appears to be severe dehydration. Their bodies will then experience rapid advanced decomposition. No useful information on the nature of SCP-026 has been gleaned from any of these subjects in the brief period after removing them from the school that they are conscious and alive. 
There have also been several cases of D-Class personnel who had participated in SCP-026 research disappearing from Foundation control, only to be found within the school at a later date. All are found sleeping, and experience the same fate as the others who mysteriously appear within the school. The same inability to wake up while inside the school appears to also apply to those who enter SCP-026 and fall asleep, though they do not suffer the same gruesome fate upon being removed from the site and waking. Such was the case for a Foundation agent who, during a routine security check of the site, was found sleeping in the entranceway of the school by his partner. They were unable to wake the agent up, and he was moved outside the building. As soon as he was outside of SCP-026, the agent regained consciousness and appeared to be in a state of extreme agitation. In later interviews, he reported that he had dreamed he was in a strange classroom, and the same dream has been reported by all subjects who have fallen asleep in the school as well as by the D-Class personnel who were later found inside. They all describe that in the dream, they are sitting inside of a classroom that closely resembles those found in SCP-026, though in the dream it is in a condition that matches how it likely appeared while it was still a functioning school. The bell rings but no one moves, and raising their hand does not get the teacher's attention. Everyone is just sitting silently. If they try to leave the classroom, they find the doors locked. They then notice what is really off about the dream. Everything is in black and white, except for the dreamer who looks down at their own hands and realizes that they are in color. Just as they begin to realize that they are dreaming, and that they are the one who is out of place, they wake up. This dream will persist, recurring over and over, and each time it takes the dreamer longer and longer to realize that they are dreaming. They also notice each time that their hands are a little more gray. Research into SCP-026 is ongoing, and all potential entrances, including both doors and windows, are to remain locked and boarded up in between investigative missions. Alarms have been placed around the location to alert Foundation personnel in the event that civilians or any other unauthorized personnel gain entry to the site. Due to the fact that even with these precautions, people continue to be found within SCP-026, and there has not yet been a reliable way discovered to prevent it, this anomaly has been classified as Euclid. While you do not appear to be at risk of any serious danger if you have not previously fallen asleep in SCP-026, pay attention to your dreams, and if at any time you find yourself back in a classroom setting where things seem, well, off, contact the nearest SCP Foundation personnel to receive Class A amnestics in order to minimize any risk of you experiencing an after-school retention. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, and make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.